Hello and welcome to the Mythical Ireland podcast. I'm Anthony Murphy. This is episode 14 of the podcast and features the second of two conversations with artist Richard Moore, who is a long-time friend and was co-author with me on Island of the Setting Sun in search of Ireland's ancient astronomers. In the first conversation in podcast 13, we spoke about Richard's life as an artist including discussion of his plans for a forthcoming book. This second conversation deals with Richard's passion for monuments and mythology and his crucial role in my own awakening to the wonders and richness of Irish mythology. We speak about the wonderful journey that began in January 1999 and culminated in the publication of our book Island of the Setting Sun. In the meantime, if you're a new listener, you might be interested in visiting the Mythical Ireland website over at mythicalireland.com. We are on facebook.com forward slash mythicalireland2 and don't forget to check out the Mythical Ireland community while you're on Facebook too. There are hundreds of hours of videos on the YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash mythicalireland. If you're on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe for regular updates and new videos. If you'd like to support Mythical Ireland, you can become a patron over at patreon.com forward slash Mythical Ireland. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Mythical Ireland. Your contributions are rewarded in the form of early and exclusive access to photographs, blog posts and articles, podcasts, videos and more. Don't forget to visit the shop on the Mythical Ireland website where you can buy signed copies of my books and also photographic prints, posters and calendars. Right, with the announcements out of the way, we can get straight on to the good stuff. I hope you enjoy this second conversation with Richard Moore. So Richard, we're back here in your studio in Dublin Road, Drada, And we had a lovely conversation the last time about your art this week we're going to go a little bit further and a little bit deeper and i wanted to start off the conversation by asking you um i think it's fair to say that when you arrived into the offices of the Drahad independent asking for me in January of 1999, which is not far off 22 years ago, that uh, life for me certainly changed very dramatically and I think very positively as a result of that initial meeting. What's your... Um, what's your... That's my story. Um, yeah, I was uh, painting out at Nouth and Douth, and I met Robert. Uh, what's his name? Robert. They have a printing place out there. They used to have. And I used to teach him in Gorms in college as a student. He was in sixth year at the time. But he, then, he went on and he was taking part in the dig with George Ogan. And he had some photographs of the inside of the chamber on the eastern side. Yeah. And so he said he'd bring them in and show them to me, because I'd never seen them. So when I was looking at the photographs, uh, I noticed there were little cup shapes. What do you call that stone that's in the recess, in the base, with the basin stone? I can't immediately remember the number. It's orthostat number such and such but I know the one because it's it's the one behind the large basin stone yes that one and it's got some very interesting uh, symbols on it hasn't it it has uh, well when he was showing me the photographs I noticed all these little dots on it and little circles with rays coming out of them and other other shapes like that now when you look at that image it's upside down in the, in the basin but I turned the photograph the other way around so that it looked like a landscape uh, with a horizon and a couple of mounds, if you take the U-shaped sh- things, 
Um, so I read them as, as a landscape with stars in the sky. But I was curious about the, if they had, if they were actually constellations. But I wasn't sure. And one of them looked a bit like Cygnus and um, the sun and, or a bright star. Mm. And I didn't know very much about astronomy. So I was asking Michael Bourne, a friend of mine who helped us discover the, the Beltre alignment. Uh, now, he said, oh, I know a chap down in the Drogheda Independent, Anthony Murphy. And he knows a lot more about astronomy than I do. So we'll go down and meet him. Allegedly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so we went down and that's uh, called, called you up and showed you the photographs and explained to you what I was thinking they might be. And did you know, could you recognise any of the, the the dots that might be constellations? And that's when you became more than fascinated by this um, idea that there could be that. So yeah, I'll I take it from there. I so. remember it very vividly, actually. Um, you had a drawing, which I think was in George Ogan's book, the first book, yes. Nelson, the Passage Tombs of Ireland. I'm not sure if you had a large blown up photocopy of it. Yes. Yeah. And you were showing me these. And as you were pointing out the stellar symbols and the possibility of constellations, I remember distinctly being very excited to the point that the hairs were standing up on the back of my neck. And, you know, I, I couldn't account for that for a long time why I should have been so excited about something that at the end of the day was very subjective. You know, if you if you see a, a sea of dots on a drawing, it's easy to make shapes from them. Um, yes, but my thing, my thing about the whole idea of making these shapes as an artist, we don't do things without a reason. Yeah. And I was trying to get inside the head of the artist carving that, why did he make those marks where he made them? What was his reason or her reason, whoever it was that carved them, to, to try and under, trying to understand why they were there um, and what logical reason could, could they uh, have for doing it like that? And so because of Martin Brennan's book, he was talking about the solar alignments and the lunar things but he didn't really talk much about the stars. Mm, so yeah. I thought maybe this is another avenue we could have a look at and it might make more sense because navigation is, um, they use stars anyway for long distance traveling. So maybe um, trying to get their bearings and where they were, what's, what's in the next hill or whatever, they were using the stars as, as possible um, reference points uh, in their art. So that was the that was the reason. Well, I think it transpired over time that I realised that, that uh, one of the reasons it was very valuable for us to have a sort of a partnership in research was because you had the artist's eye, and it's a, a, a it is a very I have found anyway. It is a very valuable thing to have an artist looking over the work of an artist. You see, when you're drawing, when you're drawing something from life, um, you're looking at the subject and you're looking at it from in relation to where you're standing. So if you move to a different location, everything changes. So reference points are very important for an artist to to use. So it's it's, it's that's you often see them using the pencil and measuring up and you know shapes and things. We're they're all, we're very conscious of that. The shape is very important to us. Yeah. So here were artists back so many years ago using shapes and and symbols. Uh, so that was that was the reason I was I was very interested in what they were doing. I wanted to understand them. I mean, there was a lot of effort to to go to haul these stones from a long distance and put them in place, shape. Them. So you had to do a lot of thinking about this. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a lot of forethought, where things were, what kind of artwork you're going to put on the building, and why it, it's supposed to say something about the building too, and, and just because we don't understand the language, 
doesn't mean that you know if it's just a, oh well, let's make a few marks here for the for the crack yeah it's not like that there's a very deliberate purpose to putting stuff where it is and it relates to their environment so that's that was my reading i wonder um when you were heading down to the office that day whether you ever could have realized what sort of can of worms you were about to open not not no idea no idea this is gonna end up where i did yeah but then i love um that kind of thing happening anyway i like to know i like to explore things because usually when you go exploring you haven't seen anything before there's always that chance of discovery you know you never know i mean it's, it was all new to me yes so it's new to me too so but I, I i think now looking back um i would say that that was the moment a very very distinctive watershed moment for me because I actually think that that was the day that I first realised that that was the day I found my bliss Mm. that was the day when a very large penny dropped you know it was like this yes this is it this is the thing that I'm here to do this work it made it made sense. It was there was something there was a kind of a truth coming out that you hadn't. Yeah, there, there must be something in this. There has to be, you know. So let's let's have a a, a good look at this, and see what happens. Yeah, see, think... it was very important to find out. If nobody was asking this question, it was very important that we we we'd ask it because, you know, it's it's finding out something, whether it's there or not. Mm. That's, that was the whole. Do we, I mean, if we found out something that wasn't so, fair enough. That would have been at least we got it out of the way. We, we, we explored that avenue, so it meant that we could go on and do something else. But it did open up a can of worms. Oh, a very, very large one. Uh, a very, a very juicy can of worms, I would say. Yes, yes. A very, so, so, and a, and a very, know. a very rewarding <laughs> can of worms. Yeah, I wonder if that the it's it's funny you should use a can of worms because that's what we use for fishing salmon with. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, I, um, yes, uh, that's a conversation we'll have later too. Um, so I think we were talking probably for the best part of an hour, and you know there I am, young reporter, supposed to be working and getting stories having a conversation in the front office of the Drogheda Independent, in the public office, not at all interested in going back to work and in doing the humdrum and, you know, the, 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 the work that I, I now realise was was just a training for the writing mm. that I was to later do. Um, but but I, I found too that it was giving me a new direction to ha- explore painting with mm-hmm. and the landscape. So I was, I was, I would apply these things to the paintings later on. More can, so. Can you remember when, when, when was the first time you painted at Bruna Bonia or you painted a monument? It was before that. Oh, it was well before that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that was the time I was, I was, I was going out. I cycled out, and that's when I saw all the the swans in the field and thinking there were sheep and wondering yeah. what were they were doing there mm. uh, because they were just in the next field the Hooper beside swans. New Bridge. Yeah. yeah but I didn't know there were Hooper that swans that was in the 1980s is yeah. 1984 it's around that you, yeah. you told me at one stage yeah so you had already been out in the landscape quite a bit painting these places and so as a non-astronomer what was it that gave you that strong intuitive feeling that there was something deeper going on with the stars and and the sky at Bruna Bonia. I say I had been I'd been doing some paintings at night time in and around the town anyway, back in nineteen eighty. So I wanted to see what the light was like and what it was like painting outdoors at night time. Mm. Uh, I got quite a few strange uh, comments from passers by. I'm sure you did, <laughs> yeah. They thought I was off, you know, completely mad. You know, I remember we painting on the bridge one night. Uh, it was a Bailey Bridge when, when St Mary's Bridge was being demolished. Myself oh. and Rayfield Hines and Andrew McKeown were painting. And 
about half twelve at night in a drizzly rain, painting the street lights and and the town, and somebody going past, Richard, no, oh, what are you doing <laughs> <laughs> this hour of the night? But uh, uh, so we were well used to being treated like madmen anyway, so it didn't bother us. Well, I certainly when you started, I and mean, when I first saw you painting at night at monuments like at Newgrange and at the Hill of Slain and at Doubt with your candles in the jar mm. I certainly thought it was unorthodox but the other side of it is for me it was it, it was an entirely natural thing for someone to be doing yeah because I had that intimate connection with the night with the stars as yes. as I had from a young a young child I'm writing a new book at the moment and it's it's mostly about astronomy and nice. I'm one of those few astronomers who actually devoted a huge amount of their time to standing out in the cold looking at the stars a great deal of astronomers are what we call armchair astronomers they like yeah. reading the books and learning the facts but which is okay they don't like having to put on extra layers and hats and scarves and two pairs of socks and bring a flask of tea out into the countryside they just they're it, missing all the fun <laughs> well that's exactly it it seemed entirely natural to me uh, mm. as a pursuit, um, you know, uh, and that later it, maybe we'll get a chance to talk well, about that as well. It, it, well, you see, I would be doing a lot of, with my father, we would have been doing a lot of fishing at night time. Uh, this is when the sea trout would come in during the summer. And the best time to catch them would be at night time. Wow. Uh, you, you put a few little chandlers on the hook and you'd fish there till about four in the morning. So... While you're waiting for something to happen, heads up, looking at the stars, yeah. just wonderful, Lovely. wonderful. Oh yeah, yeah. Just, there's nothing like it. And then in August, the the moths. I call August the month of the moths. There's, there's nothing but moths going up and down the river banks. At the flower. it's just it's, it's beautiful. It's great. Yeah. Um, then sometimes there's a mist or something, and it's it's really nice. You know, it's a very magical place to be. Uh, not, a lot of, not a lot of people would be find that but it is it's lovely when you're sitting on a river bank you're safe as anything and you're just waiting for the for the fish to take the bait and but in the meantime you look at the stars watch the satellites moving across wondering what the, what, what what was up there and mm. what, what's it like going out into space further and imagine yourself as a uh, uh, something being in Star Trek or something like that. I used to love watching Star Trek, the old, out into the deep space. God knows. You could imagine all sorts of things. It was, mm. great. It was great. Well, I think that kind of experience, by the way, um, which, I mean, I wonder how many people listening to this will have had that experience fishing at night by the banks of a river under the stars. Oh yeah, it's just... you mean you're totally in contact with nature, you yeah. know, here on the ground and and up in the sky. Yeah, there was another night we were fishing, and it was actually along the River Dee, and we were heading upriver. Uh, again, there was a very heavy mist came down, and I remember Dad saying to me, "You just stop for a minute." He said, you could imagine Coo Holland on horseback coming out of that mist. Right. And that, that was a wow, you know, that really, I, it was so believable at that moment that it, you were kind of nearly waiting for him to come out. It was that convincing. It's just the atmosphere was there. Yeah. And plus the river, of course. Yeah. The River Dee. Yeah, uh, yeah, much later I was to experience that because when we met, that was when I started taking pictures of monuments, particularly at night. And I have been by the edge of the Boyne when the mist comes in in the evening at twilight and I have found it altogether the most incredible nuministic uh, transcendent experience. Like a religious awe strikes you that you could be carried away at any moment into Chirnanog. Like you say, you imagine these characters of Irish mythology, the two at a Danon or yeah. You know, one of the red branch knights arriving out of the mist and carrying you off to some Elysium, yeah. you know, it's, it's a powerful experience. 
see, there was no, there was, see, there was no, see, it was very rural back then. Mm. There wasn't much building going on or anything, and you'd be lucky if you see another car on the way home, you know, that kind of thing. It was quite sparse. Now it's it's completely different. You don't. Were there any particular spots where you would fish? Just give me an example of particular locations. Um, well, there was it's, it, there's a place called the Joining. It's, it's on the River Dee where it meets the White River. Uh, it's, it's just outside Dunleer. Um, there's that little stretch of river that belonged to people called McKenna's at the time, now Callahan's. Um, and Dad was their family doctor, so which was handy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's the sort of thing that can open doors, all right. Yes, uh, yeah. I think he seemed to make a. He, he seemed to have a lot of patients that had rivers nearby, <laughs> so which was great. Excellent. Or, or fields to go out to go out shooting in. Yeah. So it was a it was a great lifestyle. I enjoyed it anyway. It's, it's just I saw countryside, saw a lot of the countryside because between shooting and fishing. We went to places where most people wouldn't yeah. be adventure to. Yeah. And you got to meet all the people and that. So, yeah, it was, it was great having the father as a family doctor because uh, I used to go on the calls with him. I'd sit in the car when he was finished and then sometimes you'd, you'd be invited in to have a cup of tea afterwards, you know, and have a chat and then do a bit of fishing afterwards. <laughs> and would you have any lighting at all? torches or candles or would you fish completely in the no, dark no you have to have a torch or a little lamp because um if you want to tie a hook mm, yeah. you need to have some light yeah especially if an eel is after if you're after catching an eel they twist and turn and tangle the, the line so much you really do have to spend a long time unraveling would you have been, would you have eaten your catches at times i i never like to eel uh, they they usually went back into the river. I've I've never tasted eel. No, I didn't. I don't like them. Um, Apparently, they were part of the staple diet in the Mesolithic. Oh, were they? Yeah. Before yeah. before the monuments were built, uh, salmon, trout, and eel. Apparently, oh, well, salmon eel. and trout definitely yes. Mm. Yeah. Um, now they had eel traps down at Castle Bellingham near you know where the castle is. Yeah. They used to have eel traps there. Uh, but I wasn't interested in that, but they know the little bridges across the, mm. the different... Yeah. Yeah, beautiful place. Um, and did you do any fishing on the Boyne? Not as much as the Dee. Okay, yeah. We did, if, if we were fishing on the Boyne, it was usually down near where Bruna Boyne is anyway. Yeah. And again, that was another magical place. There mm. were salmon traps there up further from Bruna Boyne. So... Down river? Up, up, up. from the centre, but before you come to Newgrange. McDonald's Lane would be the where you go down. You know where you, the buses come up and down to yeah. the centre. Well, if it, it along the river, just up from that. Okay, it's right. A hundred yards. Yeah, up there. That was a nice, it's, magical. It's spot. beautiful there, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. There's high banks on one side. Yeah. And again, the mythology would seep into your head because you know you knew you were in the landscape. So this is all kind of part of the the fishing enjoyment. You know, being in that place yeah. and having read all the stories, well, the, the children's stories about Cahullan and that would have been taught at school. Um, so you had that to enliven the, the boring moments. Mm. You were never short of imagination. Yeah. So, and then naturally later on, when I took up painting, I'd go back to these places to paint them because I enjoyed the experience and knew the place well. But now I could see it in a different light from what we've learned since. Yeah. So I had a reason to paint. Mm-hmm. Of course, before the day that you arrived into the Drought Independent, in the last conversation, we spoke about our first meeting when I met you in the street and you were painting. But the second meeting in the Drought Independent, it's probably fair to say was a much more significant one. Yes, that was that's that was the the day we started. That was really the I have to see you. You know, we'll have to take some notes about this. Yeah. And, uh, when can I see you again? So, well, before you left, I, I remember that we had uh, decided upon an excursion to the Boyne Valley at the next opportunity, which was, which was probably the next Saturday or the next Sunday. 
I can't remember the exact dates, mm. but I certainly remember that. Um, but that was definitely the beginning. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, that was the beginning of, of everything. Um, yeah. Like, for me, really, uh, it's very easy for me to pinpoint uh, the moment in time when Mythical Ireland was born, in essence, although it wasn't created until the year the next year, March 2000. But, like, that was the moment when, as I say, my life changed very, very radically, very dramatically, yeah. for the better, I yeah. think. And set me on a path that I've been on ever since. And I never could have realised that day. I knew there was something. You know, you just have this in, in, feeling in your gut. Uh, an intuitive feeling that we, we both, I think, have anyway, naturally. That yeah, something there's something about this inside. that is, you know, mo- more significant than just two people having a conversation. Mm. We took the We took the bait. <laughs> Use another fishing analogy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's good. And then we met, and I'm not sure whether we went in your car or in mine, but I know very soon after that first meeting, we went out into the Boyne Valley, and the first place we went to was Doubt. And I remember it was a grey day, murky kind of a misty drizzly day mm. um, and I remember being back at Douth it had been a while probably a number of years since I'd been there and I remember just getting the feeling that we were standing on something really awesome mm. that this was much more than the passage tomb which is the label that had been given it you know mm. Well, it was, it's, I was be thinking more of the people that built it and the effort they put in, in them creating this. It was all, it was, you know, this is like a big land art to me, you know, big, big monument of sculpture and art. It mm, was interesting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, you're thinking it from a builder's point of view, you know, it's just, it's just this, um, not the way we build cathedrals and things like that. Well, this was just another version of that. Yeah. But they had the same unified thought. We must do this. This is for... And that comparison has often been made, actually, that it wasn't necessarily money... No, no. ...that built the great cathedrals of Europe. It was this collective zeal, this willingness for the individual part to participate in a great community activity which was to leave a very very significant landmark uh, to people's beliefs and and I suppose you could say the same about the great monuments of Bruna Bonia couldn't you certainly you could um, so yeah well, I got an awful lot of painting out of it <laughs> um there wasn't a. I don't think there was a patch I didn't walk on out there. And yet, every time I go out, there'd be something new. Mm. Walking, walking the ground. You see, you're watching, watching for everything. You know, you're watching for things in the ground or the lie of the land. You know, why is when you're on this level, you can see other levels, and why they they seem to be significant. That the mound is built in such and such a place where you can view another mound that, that's in line with the horizon and stuff like that or you know the levels were important yeah um, this is because of the art you know you, you're kind of trying to do, make up composition so the composition of the land was very interesting for me because when you're in one spot you're looking at another and you can see the way things are laid out which and then you're asking yourself why 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 did I put it just there? What's what's yeah. going on behind that or what's going on in between? Um, it was more of an art. It was like an exploring it through an artist's way of of looking at things. Yeah, that, well, that's what it was. It became very exciting for me when you started to talk about mythology, and you I, were the one who started to tell me the stories that at that time I didn't know about. Um, 
like everybody knows the salmon of knowledge and yeah. they know something about Cúchulainn and they've heard of Finn McCool and and they've heard of the kings of Tara. But how many people, for instance, had heard the story of Tuch Mark Eitain, for instance? How many people knew about Ashlinga Angus, or the dream of Angus? Mm. How many people knew about the Dinshemachus and all the rich uh, body of lore that's there that tells us real information about the monuments? And then when you started to talk about the stars on top of all that, I mean, I was euphoric. Mm. The two greatest interests yeah. were combined all at once. Well, I think it was the eclectic nature of it, you know. I have often said, and I'm actually, I've said it so often, I sound like a broken record. <laughs> but I've often said that if you had told me in January of 1999, Anthony, you're going to write books about Bruna Bonia, um, I'll leave it to the readers of those books to judge whether they're of any significance or not my answer to you would have been no but sure all of the books have been written by the experts that's what we thought and yet when you came to me in the Drogheda Independent here was a clear deficiency because I my father brought home George Ogun's book in 1984 it was a, I think it was a review copy mm-hmm. uh, he had been sent in the newspaper and I remember plundering it. I remember sneaking it off and borrowing it on a regular basis and <laughs> poring over it. I found it astonishing what was there that we hadn't known about until basically the previous couple of decades. Um, but here you were pointing out a deficiency in that despite the presence of what are clearly, well, okay, this is subjective, but what appear to be clear representations of the sun, stars, moons. Mm-hmm possibly constellations none of this was getting mentioned in the expert works yeah that was that used to I used to wonder about that but then I realised later when when these archaeologists are studying the stuff they're, they're trained in a certain way which in a good way too because they make sure everything is right when they're going through stuff which was to our benefit in the long run because we couldn't do this without them yeah. No, the archaeologists are so important. One hundred percent agree. Yeah, and and you know, the information they gathered was so important. Okay, they didn't. They weren't astronomers. Correct. And that was that's not to no fault of their own. No, to be fair to them, because they have to specialize in something. But uh, and then you had the folklore people who were specialized in the storytelling, but they didn't know anything about astronomy. Uh, not, and not necessarily anything about ar- archaeology. Yeah. But so you had three strands. Of, you had astronomers, you had archaeologists, and then you had the, the, what's the other one? Folklorists. The folklorists. All separately running parallel, but but keeping a brilliant record of what they had. Yes. So it was a bit like... But not converging in any way. No, they didn't, they didn't, yeah, they didn't... Yeah, or, or not to be fair, not not converging to any great extent. No, I mean, but, Kelly did mention the mythology of Newgrange in his Newgrange book. Yeah, yes, it, they do, but it's it's mentioned, but because it's part of it, but it's not understood. And I think the part where we were trying to do is well, if you look at all three together, then something might make sense. That's that's all I was saying. Yeah, there has to be there has to be sense to what they were doing. They just, they can't just build all these things and not make any sense out of it. Yes. Um, so when you put the astronomy, the archaeology, and the folklore together, then it begins to make some sense to the overall picture. It's like a it's like um it's in medicine, you have a GP who specializes in who specializes in one branch of medicine, but you might not necessarily know anything about other parts of it yes. as good. Yeah, yeah. So, but so they're almost too specialised for what they were dealing with. But, but again, they need to be, mm. because then you're getting the proper information from that source. Yeah. But it's up to a general overlook, you know, looking at this and that, and see if they all um, match together. You know, ti- timeline with the place, with the folklore. 
if, if, you, if they all layer one on top of the other perfectly, well then you know you've got something. But if there's any diversions from one of them, it doesn't fit with the other two, well then there's a problem. Mm. It doesn't work. There's something that has to be looked at. Yeah. But generally speaking, over the years that we've been looking at the stories and the astronomy with the, with the archaeology, they all seem to be converging m much better. Uh, in a so very fruitful and meaningful way, yeah, I would say. Well, like I say, you say, um, the archaeologists, that you were t we were talking about the astronomy going, dating back to such and such a time, and then you had the DNA coming back saying, you know, a, a, you know BC, such and such a thing. The uh, stars were aligned with this, that, and the other. You know, they, it makes sense that they're fitting in together. But if any of them don't fit, then there's something not right. It's not working. It doesn't. It just means it's the truth of the matter is what important. It's not trying to fit a theory in that fits, and then dismissing things if they don't come true. You have to take all the all the evidence. You know, just follow the evidence and um, see what happens. Yeah, I think it's fair to say in the earliest days. So. We met in January 99 and for several months, uh, although we were tipping away, visiting sites and doing research and having long conversations on the phone in the evening time, I remember those conversations. <laughs> um, we didn't n realize then that we would actually be able to make a significant contribution in terms of a greater understanding of the Boyne Valley in the context of those three disciplines. Yeah. In other words, we had a sense, an intuitive sense at the beginning, yeah. that mythology was important to understanding the place and an intuitive sense that astronomy was important to understanding the place. But we didn't realise uh, that, I think, until we started making discoveries. And I think the first of those was Baltray. Yeah, that was a, yeah the Beltray stone and the the story that we put, we found the story afterwards, didn't we? We found the story about Balor and yeah. the magic cow afterwards. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I thought that was a I thought that was a a nice thing to show up, mm. especially the two two stories. There were two stories pertaining yeah. to Baltray, Yeah, but at the time we made the discovery, I don't think we were immediately aware of either. No. Well, tell us a little bit about when 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 was your first visit to Baltray? Because I remember when you told me about this pair of standing stones, I hadn't a clue what you were talking about. Because like most people, I didn't know they existed. Well, I didn't either until someone t mentioned it to me. That's right. But I don't actually remember the first time going out. Yeah. Was that long before we made the discovery? Or was it months or was it years? Uh... It could have been months rather than mm, years. Yeah. yeah, and I remember you showed me a painting. Yeah, and I was like, I've never seen those. Yeah, and and at the in almost the same breath, I'd like to see those. <laughs> <laughs> of course, oh, they were they were magnificent. Yeah, um, yeah, Beltray. Well, I, I, yeah, I don't know where to go with that. Well, I think it was May. I think. Yeah. I think I wrote that in the Drone Henge book. It was May 99 yeah. when yourself and Michael discovered this curiosity about the larger stone. Yeah. About it being, yeah, well, see, Michael was, Michael had the binoculars and he wanted to have a look at Rockabill because he had, he had some association with Scaries and Rockabill when he was younger and he wanted to see where Rockabill was. So what he did was he put the binoculars up against the stone to to hold it steady. And it just and he said, Come here, look at this. And so when I looked through the thing, there was Rockabill in the view. As if it was dead lined up. And that's when we told you about it. And then you made the point about I think that's a, a winter sauce of sunrise. Yeah. And then you checked it out and it was. But I, I remember more specifically than that. I thought that was very curious, first of all, that when you look along the edge of the stone, you're looking at Rockabill. Again, this is before I had read all the texts and the papers and the books. Where, and the likes of, for instance, Alexander Thom, where 
those foresights, those distant yes. foresights were very important. Yeah. Quite often, uh, passage tombs point towards notches in hills, islands out to sea, uh, mountain peaks, yeah. other passage tombs, Well, that was before we knew any of that. Exactly. And yet it was almost an intuitive thing. I knew that was important. But I remember your ship's compass. Oh, yeah. You see, you brought that out and you placed it on the ground some distance from the stone. So the stone, yeah. because the stones we, we found tended, tended to have an influence on the, on, the, on the compass if it was within a couple of metres. That's right, yeah. And I, I remember you gave me the bearing. And, and at the time, uh, True North and Magnetic North were something like eight degrees separated. And I remember being very confused for a while about what you had to do. Did you have to add eight degrees or take them away? Yes, and I used to have to look at the Ordnance Survey map every time to figure out what to do. I could never <laughs> remember. But when I made the calculation, I think the result was something like 131 degrees of azimuth. Yeah. And I said to myself, that's southeast. Yeah. That's shockingly close to winter solstice. Mm. And I said it to yourself and Michael. That's right. I think that's... My memory would be that you were slightly dubious about that. You were like, oh, I don't know. It's not that far south, is it? Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't sure. You see. Yeah, because yeah. you, you hadn't seen yeah. the sun rises in winter, so you couldn't tell. No, so it was you that cottoned on to that. Yeah, but I, I mean... Uh, uh, I, I, Great look, discovery, though. Well, 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 yes, but 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 yeah, for the for the sake of the listeners, uh, it has to be said that I have always always considered that a three way discovery. I don't think it could have been any other way. Uh, I don't. I well, don't think I could have found it independently. You found the stones. Michael found the alignment. I suggested it was winter solstice. Yeah. So it was three of us involved in it. If Michael hadn't suggested it, I wouldn't have said it. And, uh, yeah. and so what happened on winter solstice well I just to t- tee you up before you answer I know that that was the year of the, the RTE broadcast at Newgrange the, the dawn of the new millennium they were right. they were painting it as a as the, the sort of the, the first winter solstice sunrise of the or the last one of the old millennium and the first one of the new one or whatever yes. and so I decided I wanted to go to Newgrange um, you know to capture that but you and Michael were to go to Baltray yeah. If memories, we were, we were dispatched. If, if dispatched, yeah. <laughs> no, they were asked nicely. Would they go out to Baltray that morning? Yeah, so we, if memories serves me right, Richard, you were almost late for that appointment. Almost, yeah. We were kind of late getting up, as none, neither of us are early risers. That's for sure. Uh, Michael and myself never like getting up early in the morning. So this was a a big thing to do. So anyway, we drove out. And we could just see the sun coming up. So we started to run up the hill to try and get there before it happened. And Michael got to the stone and set up the camera quickly and, and got the shot. He had a, a camcorder. A camcorder, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So he, he got the recording so just in time. Yeah. And so... Uh, it proved your point. It was later on that day, because again, this is the day, this is before we all had mobile phones. And so it was later on that day before you and I got to talk on the phone, and you said, "Yeah, it's it's it's, it's, pretty, spot it's pretty spot on." Now it's the it's sun. Slightly off. Yeah, we should say for the sake of the listeners who who don't know their uh, intricate astronomy that the sun rises two sun widths to the left now of where it rose then, uh, due to uh, a, a slight wobble of the Earth's axis called the obliquity of the ecliptic. Um, but it, it rose about two sun widths to the left of Rockabilly, which yeah. kind of proved the point that it was likely to be a, a solstice orientation. So, the, the, yeah, and this is the, where the story came in later. The the ballot and the cow and the calf came in to make sense of that. Um, I think you're better at telling that story. I found that. I didn't find that. Um, that was from the, the folklore, the Irish folklore archives. Now, I'm not sure if it was from the, the 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 folklore collection or the schools collection. It looks to me like it was the schools collection. It was actually published in. Was this a woman, an eighty-year-old woman, had told it yes. to somebody? Yeah, yeah. So, like, that's the schools collection. Yes, must be. Was kids who went off to interview the elders of their community about yeah. these things, and she she had said that Balor had stolen the Glasgowman, the magic cow from Ulster. Mm. and was bringing it down along the coast with, the calf. Uh, with its calf. And the calf it, had to be kept in front of the yeah. cow 
so that it wouldn't turn around. So the cow wouldn't get nervous. The calf was led ahead of the cow. And it's very it's told in very simple language that yeah. all was going well until they crossed the River, Boyne. Boyne so that and that's an immediate sort of alarm bell. Oh, yeah. they crossed the Boyne. What does that mean? They crossed, you know, that they passed the mouth of the Boyne, the sun, yeah. on its way down the horizon. And Balor is definitely a solar deity of some kind, a malevolent, malevolent version of this, the solar deity. But what happened then was, of course, the calf they, fell the, behind. The, the calf fell behind and then the cow, wondering where the calf was, turned around to see that uh, the, where the calf was and then realised she'd been led astray and let her a big scream, thus causing Balor to turn around to see what happened. Uh, because his eye was opened, um, he turned them to the Rockabill Islands and that's why you have the big island to the south and the small island mm. to the north. Brilliant. So that was the... He petrified them. Petrified them yeah. He wanted to see what was going on and he opened his great eyelid which is the sun. I mean, it's a, a metaphor for the sunrise. He opened his great eyelid and immediately petrified them, turned them to stone. And like you say, the cow being the southerly one and yes. the calf, the smaller island to the north, just as the story says. Yeah, that was inter- interesting. because And then the name Baltre, which is obviously we often wondered, is that really what... Where the name comes from. Balor's, Balor's Strand, Strand which Balor. is what we call the first chapter yeah. in Island of the Setting Sun when it was written. That's right. Balor Strand. And, and again, look, that's a speculative notion on our part, but it's one based on the story. But I did think that the crossing of the Boyne was the key because the Baltray Stones are situated at what one could say is a very significant strategic location. Mm. That is overlooking basically the junction or the estuary where the river meets the sea. And according to Professor Mitchell, that's where the river did actually pass under those yeah. stones. So, mm. pity, pity actress. And it was only later, I think, that we both realised that um, they're they're made of shale, but they look like the same grey wacky that the, the, stuff, the yeah. stones of Newgrange and, and some of the stones at, at Nouth, etc., are made of. Which came from Clare Which Head. came from Clare Head. Mm. And the archaeologists have a broad consensus, although not everybody agrees with it, that they were brought to Brunabonia on the underneath of a barge along the sea and up the river. Mm. And so here you had basically a signpost in the form of standing stones. Now, there apparently were originally three, and there are only two standing stones standing now. I believe future um, geophysical study and perhaps excavation will reveal the socket of the third one. Mm-hmm. But I believe I've nothing. there's nothing... T- in my mind that that will sway me from the belief that they were actually in a line the third one the socket will be found in line with the other two not offset from them yeah uh, anyway that's uh sort of going off the track a little bit um because this this is a this is a signpost isn't it for the for yeah. those who are bringing the the well the usually stones if, to if, you're, Bonia. if you're out sailing it's if you want to get a, a bearing on where the river is they usually put um two objects on the shoreline so that when you're out at sea when you're coming if you want to find the river and the, the proper channel to come into you have to line the two together yeah so then you get your you get your course into the river the maiden's tower and yeah. the lady's finger at mornington being a very good example yeah exactly. just across the way actually just across probably just a mile away or less Maybe from the baltray yeah. standing stones yeah so it might have been an early navigation point to enter the river with, but it also it's also the first monument on the River Boyne as you enter it that marks the winter solstice. Yeah. Yes. So it's doing yeah. exactly what Newgrange does. Same alignment as Newgrange, made of the same stone. Yeah. A very different type of alignment, granted. But the other thing was that weren't we hampered for a long time? in various aspects of our research by the fact that we found it difficult to assess whether there was any consensus about dating. So with standing stones, for instance, it's it's widely or commonly believed among archaeologists that standing stones are Bronze Age in date. And that's frustrating for us because we wanted it to be Neolithic in date. Yeah. So there's no evidence, there's no archaeological evidence that will support our notion. But the astronomical 
certainly would suggest it. Yes, but this, and and the story you see at the story and the astronomical thing happening there is matching together. So, whether the, if the archaeology adds to that, then you have it. There's no doubt. Mm. But until yeah. the archaeology definitely dates mm. the place, or, they're very difficult to date, of yeah. course. Um, but I mean, those factors alone, which I don't think. I realise, and I'm not speaking for you, I'm just definitely going to speak for myself, I don't think I have realised that until actually the last decade, this the most recent period of time, that probably we should have placed more emphasis when we wrote Island of the Setting Sun about the fact that they're made of the same stone as Newgrange, they were likely brought from the same place, Clare Head, that they would have um, formed, they would have represented this navigational beacon, yeah. as you speak, which the builders of Newgrange would have become very familiar with because they had to make repeated journeys yes. up to Clarehead, down along the coast, along the sea, turning at Baltray into the River Boyne That's right. and navigating the Boyne. Yeah. By the way, that distance, I measured that. It's 31 kilometres from Clarehead to the, the likely landing point at, at Newgrange. Wow. That's 31 That's kilometres one way. <clears throat> it's a 62 kilometre round trip for each stone. That's something to think about. Mm. The effort that went into it. Yeah. And um, we became interested too, didn't we, in the story of Bowen and uh, her lap dog? Because after creating the Boyne River, she was drowned out at sea and at her dog astral, was yeah. drowned. And we postulated that Bowen and the dog might represent, for instance, the cow, uh, the cow representing the moon and the calf representing Venus. Or in the case of Bowen, you know, the dog star. Yeah. You know, um, Sirius, because in the Neolithic, again, you have to push back from the Bronze Age. Yeah. You have to go back to the Neolithic for Sirius too. So Sirius is the brightest of all the stars in the night sky. And it happens that at the time Newgrange was built, Sirius shared the same declination as winter solstice sun. In other words, an observer at the standing stones of Baltray would see the dog star rising out of Rockabill every That's night. Right. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. That makes more sense. And then what was the third story, Richard? The third story was about Cuchulain and his only son. Oh, yeah. What's, what was his name? Uh, Conla. Conla, yeah. Aoife, Aoife's only son. When, when, when Cuchulain had been off training with Scawhawk in Alba or in Scotland, uh, he, he had uh, gone to bed with Aoife. And, and I don't think he knew, didn't he not? No, he didn't. He didn't know that she, 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 she gave birth. But he did. I don't think he did. Because no, because he gave her instructions to not to give his name when he when he arrived to Ireland. Yeah. So, so he, when he was <coughs> arriving, he didn't know that it was his son. Yeah, he did because the, the son didn't reveal himself. No. And he wouldn't reveal himself until his... But the key thing about that story is the location and the fact that there's a pair of standing stones in yes. it. Yes. The location is coastal. Cuchulain is up on the bluff looking down which it, which on it the is. sea. And of course, all that land has been reclaimed naturally over the past number of millennia but in the Neolithic Frank Mitchell maintains the sea came right up to the base of the bluff there beneath the yeah. stones yeah and one of the things Cucullin did during their fight was he stood up on the two standing stones oh, sure. yeah so there were three stories actually then really weren't there the most significant I think was the one about the cow the cow and uh, the cow. about Balor and the cow and the calf because it mentions the boyne and it's almost like the sun rising at Rockabill, Balor's evil eye being opened. It just, yeah. I mean, it just fits so nicely. Well, it's so in line. Nicely. It's in, it's, it's, the location's correct. Yeah. Yeah. And you can't do it anywhere else. And so that first year of our research turned out to be very valuable because at the beginning of the year, we were, in, a, in essence, faffing about a little bit. We didn't really know what we were at. You had a reasonably good knowledge of the archaeology of the landscape. You had a fairly good knowledge of the stories I had a good knowledge of the astronomy and we were putting that all together. Mm. And all of a sudden at Baltray, we had a, a, a discovery, an astronomical alignment, apparently confirmed by the stories, Yes, which I think was wonderful. Yeah, it, was a, it, it gave us um, the will to go on. Yeah, That's, definitely. That, 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 Excuse me. When you get stuff like that, that really makes you, yeah, we're doing something right. Mm. We're on to something here, so... Let's let's keep going. Yeah, it wasn't easy, but it was it was worth doing it. Yeah, well, yeah, it wasn't easy. 
Um, it was very time consuming, but it was very rewarding time. Oh, yes. Yeah. 24 hours a day, uh, you know, seven days a week on your head. Yeah. Well, yeah, that was, that was a lot. I, I know that in those early days when we would have our phone conversations and I remember our phone, you know, this is before we didn't even have a portable phone. So the phone was connected to the socket by a wire and I had to sit on the bottom of the stairs and I'd be running in and out to the bookshelves <laughs> to grab a book and we would get very excited about talking about certain things. But I remember distinctly that I would ring you, I'd be ringing you to tell you, look, I found this reference in this book too, blah, blah, blah. And you apparently had an insatiable, unstoppable, indefatigable <laughs> habit of reading because I might have spoken to you the previous day or two days ago. And in the meantime, you would have read large tracts of books and would be able to point out loads of things to me. Yeah, I look for patterns because that's what we do is, again as artists. We look at shape patterns, you know, it's just something. Again, it's like the flow of water. You're looking at these patterns that keep coming back. You say there's something happening here. So you put, make a note of it. But it's the same with um, researching. You're kind of looking for patterns or things that just don't seem to jump out. You know, you're reading something and then something just jumps out. You say, well, what's going on there? Mm. You have a look at that. Yeah. And that's usually what happens. And there is some obscure detail <laughs> in mythology, isn't there? And apparently yeah. nonsensical or not nonsensical, but but uh, passages that perhaps most people cannot make sense of. I just want, to, I want to make a point here because people you often wonder about these stories being not that important. <clears throat> now, there was a, a local folklore, a local storyteller, I should correct, you say, uh, was telling a friend of mine that um, when they want to change a story, they all, all, the, all the storytellers in the country have to meet to decide whether that word, one word, can be changed. Now, I was, I thought this was kind of ridiculous because... Wow, yeah. But then again, I was thinking, so why would they do that? You know, why, why is it so important, you know, to keep the story so perfect? <coughs> and, then I, and then I was thinking about maths. You know, when you're doing maths, well, if you put a plus or a minus in the wrong place, it ain't going to work. So these people were putting the same emphasis. So that's what made me sort of think, well, maybe it's more to do with navigation and, and, and making sure that the story is told exactly the way it should be. Because when you're traveling using this story, you need to know you have the right you know, directions. Mm. You don't take a wrong turn because you left out a bit or you added a bit. So it's much the same way. I, I look at these stories as being mathematical um, navigation aids. It'd be like a GPS system back then, like an ancient GPS system. Yeah, before yeah, the story is actually before good. there were roads yes, as such. Yeah, yeah. So there were only the natural features of the landscape and some man-made ones, of course. Yeah, you had you have all these features, but you also had the stars. So where the features were, the stars would land and make make you know that was they were fixed in their landing points. So. You knew where you were going if you had that direction. It's much, it's, it's much the same as navigation by pilots back in the, before they got the GPS systems in. They had to use uh, star navigation to yeah. guide them from lo for long distance. So, yeah. so much the same as any long distance ship will travel. So these people were no different. They had to have some way of marking their journey. Yeah, and of course we know, and I don't think it's ever been in doubt, that the the people of prehistoric Ireland, um, in the main, were were mariners and navigators, because the only way in and out of the country is by both, sea, yeah. and uh, all of the migrations, according to mythology and of course according to archaeology, uh, this is where they both concur very definitely, is, is that all of the migrations arrived from the sea. Yeah, so these people had to know their star navigations mm. aids so yes. it makes sense yeah that way so richard um we were talking about baltray and we were talking about navigation and we were talking about the fact that the people of the neolithic who built the monuments were were undoubtedly skilled mariners excuse me but you had a a theory pertaining to 
uh, navigation by place names, what you call the sort of prehistoric GPS. Um, the navigation through place uh, names, place names of uh, mythology. Uh, was, uh, like if we knew the story about the place relating to other places, that was like having a GPS system of the day. Yeah. So if you knew. You, if you knew the story well, you knew which direction to go in. And this is what I was saying about these um, storytellers not wanting to misplace one word out of it because it'd be like a maths equation. If you put a plus or a minus or a, a wrong number in the wrong place, you'd lose direction. Yeah. So it would make sense if the stories were so important to these people. Yeah. And you had a particular theory pertaining to, like... In the Dungeonicus about the Boyne, there's lots of names given to the Boyne. Well, first of all, the different s- sections of the Boyne are given names. Yeah. The arm and the leg of the wife of Nuadu, for in, 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 in for instance, where Bowen lost her arm and leg as she was washed down to sea. But then it says it mentions the Ban and it mentions other rivers and it mentions other great rivers in the world. And you thought that this might have been some sort of it's a, a navigation aid to get yeah. from one place to another. You see, if you're sailing, well, it depends on the kind of boat you have. If it's not, uh, if you, if you can be dangerous going out into the sea. Oh, yeah. You know, it doesn't take much to capsize a boat or throw you overboard. Yeah. Especially if you're carrying stones. <laughs> yes. Uh, so the shortest journey possible between... Um, one place or another is, is ideal. But the safest route would be by rivers. So if you use the sea as least the least amount as possible and get onto a river and find a connecting pathway up to the next uh, area and then move on to the next river, if there's links and connections, uh, you all, it means one thing it means is you'll have fresh water all the time. Yeah. And if you didn't have containers to carry fresh water for a long distance, um, it was wise to go by river. You also had the, the the fish in the river to feed on. Yeah. So you had food and water all the way from going. This is this is the journey. So the Dinshanikas makes sense if you go by the journey it gives you that you have food and water on that journey all the way, uh, with the least amount of use on the sea. So you can get up to up to Scotland, uh, coming through the rivers. And so if you knew the story, and of course you probably had to know the story, um, you would be able to find your way safely. Yeah. Using the story as a guide. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. It makes sense. And of course that in combination with the fact that the stories probably had a lot of encoded astronomy in them meant that you could find your way by the stars as well. Yeah, exactly. Mm. So, um, it makes, uh, see, I did a lot of sailing as well, so you're aware of what what it's like out there. Yeah. And if you, if, you, if you have to go on a journey, well, nowadays you can have containers of plastic bags and bottles and you can carry plenty of water. But it is important you have water, fresh water, and food. So... Um, that to me made sense that way. Yeah, it makes more sense of the Gentanicus that way. Um, yeah, fascinating. Of course, I don't know whether you realised all that in nineteen ninety nine, but I think by the time that year had finished, we kind of knew. I think we had the feeling anyway that we were onto something. That we weren't just poking around in the dark per se. But then the next year, 2000, was was equally significant. Uh, because that was the year that we made our second discovery, which was at the Douth Henge. Site Q, as it is inelegantly labelled on the archaeological maps. Um, That's a big site. It's next to Douth. So it's not too far from Douth. I remember the first time you brought me there. Back 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 then the estate was owned by the pigeons. Uh, two brothers and a sister who lived in the house there. Patsy and Johnny and Annie. Yeah. Of course they're all 
All gone now. All gone now. Um, and you used to call there and ask them, was it okay if we went down? And I remember, I, I mean, I've spoken about it and I wrote about it in the Drone Henge book about how impressive a monument it is when you stand up on the top of the banks there. You really get the impression of some sort of coliseum or stadium, don't you? Yeah. It's, yeah it's it a, isn't a folly. Like, none of these things were erected or put there without a grand purpose. No, then when you see the overall the LIDAR image of the place, it makes sense that they're all connected. Um, yeah, that was a that was another great discovery always. But that required us to get up at ungodly hours of the night, even though it was midsummer. Yeah, when was it <laughs> half four or five? Yeah, o'clock? well, I think I think um, we had agreed to meet uh, at half four, and I think the sunrise was, if memory serves me right, shortly after five a.m. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually distinctly remember it. Um, we we were. Hang, hanging around there under the trees and it was a bit windy and it was quite cloudy but it being midsummer it was kind of mild enough you know waiting and wondering are we absolutely bonkers <laughs> are we mad in the head it everyone didn't... else is in bed right. doing what normal people do at four <laughs> o'clock in the morning sleeping yeah but it was lovely, lovely, lovely atmosphere, lovely place to be. And what was the reason we were there was because... I, 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 me, I, Watch that sunrise. Yeah. To see if it was going to happen. Where right did that place. idea... I'm sorry, I'm not immediately remembering how we surmised that the two gaps, the two entrances into the embankment were li- aligned on the solstices. We didn't find out until quite a bit later that Ronald Hicks ha- had proposed that in 1985. Yeah. We had found this independently, but was that was that your... Uh, I can't remember, to be yeah, honest I, with you. I'm having trouble right now remembering how it was we came to think <coughs> that it might be solstice alignment. It was just that there were two gaps in the in the henge, and it was the two gaps, their alignment was, was pointing roughly towards summer solstice sunrise, so... We just said, so yeah. we go out and have a look just to make sure. It was probably the sort of thing that was easy to see on an archaeological yes. plan. Yeah. If you just plotted a line through the two gaps, you would see that it points northeast and southwest. Yeah. So approximately corresponding with the su- with summer sunrise and winter solstice sunset. But you couldn't be sure because if, sometimes if we're in a landscape, there might be a hill that might be too high or too mm. low or, and it wouldn't match up. But So we just wanted to be there in situ to make sure that what we thought might happen would happen. And 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 so the clouds did part, thankfully, because for a time it seemed like we'd have to come back again the next day. (laughs) Uh, Not 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 too nice of an idea. (laughs) It depends. Uh, Some people can can, uh, Mm. suffice with uh, five hours sleep. It's famously said about Margaret Thatcher, the former British Prime Minister, that she was able to get by on three hours sleep. But uh, I think we were both definitely... A, a, I, I, I needed at least eight hours in order to be able to function properly. Yeah, well, I like my bed too, so getting up out of it had to be um, uh, severe, a lot of willpower to get out. <laughs> <laughs> but the curious thing about the Douthenge was that in order to observe the alignment, you actually had to be outside of the monument. Yeah, you narrow the gap when you stand back further. Yeah. So you get a more accurate reading. So. Oh, we were situated beyond the southwestern entrance, outside of the monument, yeah. looking along the line of the two gaps towards the northeast. Yeah. And when the sun finally did appear, when the clouds broke... It was in the right direction. Yeah. And that was a eureka moment in itself. It was. It just confirmed that what we were looking for was so, you know. Yeah. But we had to be sure that it was so because there's no point in saying something and it's not. No. You haven't confirmed it. And at that stage, I had, of course, 
actually another thing that I can credit you with is that um, although I had a passing interest in photography, it was only actually when I met you that I really began to take a lot of photographs. And I remember that I was taking a lot of photographs. Of course, those are the days of uh, print and slides before digital cameras became a thing. Um, and I, I have the pictures actually of... A, it must have been a photo you took of me because I'm in the photo in Ireland. Is is that in Ireland or is it in the Joan Henge book? I think it's in Ireland of the setting sun. Mm. There's a picture of me standing there and you can see my tripod and my camera. And so that must have been taken by you. Mm-hmm. Um, because they're a very important record, of course. Because if you've be, been there and you've witnessed it, it's very, it's 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 all 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 very well to uh, describe it in, in words, but to see it in a picture makes mm. it kind of undeniable, doesn't it? It does, yeah. But then we encountered a difficulty, and that was that Geraldine Stout believed, having studied the embanked enclosures of the Boyne region, she had concluded that the northeastern entrance of Site Q. Uh, was recent that it it she reckoned it had been opened sometime in modern history yeah. to facilitate the movement of livestock and farm machinery, mm-hmm. and that cast a serious doubt on the whole thing for me anyway. It certainly yeah. did. Well, and rightly so. You have to be. You want to be sure about things, you know. We weren't paranoid about the archaeologists. We were friends with them, and in fact, Geraldine and her her husband Matthew are have long been very good friends of ours. Uh, and I think it's w- one of the things that always stood to us in everything that we, we wrote and researched was that we did not want to throw out the archaeological evidence if it didn't fit our hypothesis. No. We we wanted to make sure that what we said fitted with the archaeological evidence. Yeah. There's just no point in having a theory and it's not it's wrong, you know. Yeah. Because it's going to, it's going to come out at some later stage and you might as well get it right at the beginning and to be sure that it things are as they should be yeah not to fit the theory yeah it's best to find out uh, to know the truth is always best you know the truth always it's always better in the long run because then you, you can't it's solid ground you know yeah I remember so, we had a conversation with uh, Gabriel Cooney and uh, Gabriel is a professor of archaeology attached to University College Dublin UCD and I remember we asked him about the dates of those embanked enclosures of the henges. Yeah. Not all henges are embanked enclosures, as we would later later find out. Um, and I remember being very excited when he told us that they were likely to belong to that horizon between the late Neolithic and the early Bronze Age, mm. which meant it was very ancient. Mm. So it was another sort of little confidence booster for us, in a sense, notwithstanding the the difficulty around Geraldine's belief about the northeastern entrance. It maybe it was a case that uh, I was looking for the the archaeology to prove the astronomy right, but I, I always had the sense from that was June two thousand. It was St John's Eve. It was uh, oh, June. Yeah. It was June the twenty third. Mm. So two days officially after summer solstice, but with the sun still rising in the same place. Um, and, and and I remember, you know, thinking that I think the astronomy is right, but the archaeology is arguing with it. And we, I, I mean, I remember Mythical Ireland, the website had begun in March of 2000. And I remember, you know, putting up images and, and words about the uh, apparent alignment of, of, of Site Q. But it, it, it was left hanging for a long time, wasn't mm. it? Mm. Until... You actually met Ronald Hicks. Which I think stands to this day as the most extraordinary of a long series of coincidences. Yeah. Because we we had encountered a lot of coincidence in in our early researches. Yeah. Um, Yeah, there was a stage where I was... Not sure where this these little guidance were coming from, and I'm being Christian. I didn't want to be delving into the dark the dark side of things, so I wasn't too keen on um, promoting um, a bad thing in a religious sense uh, because it is pagan and it has 
early origins pre-Christian. Now, this is not to say, you see, the, the coincidence that we were having was it felt as if something was guiding us all along. And um, one particular thing was, I was studying the Cygnus, yeah. <clears throat> the, the Swan constellation, and I had been doing a lot of stuff and I got, I, I ran into a lot of doubts about where all this stuff was coming from, uh, these coincidences. And I was a bit nervous about um, the dark side making a, a show of it. I think know. we referred to them at that time as spooky coincidences. Spooky coincidences, yes. Almost as if they had a slight malevolent edge to them. Yes. And so that made me a little nervous about delving into something I wasn't sure about. So I said, it got to the stage where I, I had, I was a very doubtful and I just said, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to abandon this whole project because I just, I didn't want it to go any further. And I remember distinctly you saying that to me a couple yeah. of times on the phone. Yeah. So, um, so I did, I said, right, that's it. I'm not just touching this stuff anymore. <laughs> no, <laughs> unless I get some uh, positive feedback. So I said me prayers. Um, you know, this is if, if you want me to continue on with this, just give me something that will leave me in no doubt about show this. Show me uh, a sign. <laughs> show me a sign, yeah. And it did come, but in the most unexpected way. Uh, sometime after I had abandoned the project, I was still thinking about Cygnus and, you know, where it was in the sky. And it was this was about half one in the morning. My bedroom's at the back of the house. And I was thinking... You know, I wonder if Cygnus, where it should be now, if I, if I look out my window, it should be just up to my left side, if I look up into the sky. Now, there's only a little gap in the sky there where you can see this. So, I was lying in the bed, I oh, feck it, I have to find out. You know? so, <laughs> <laughs> so, I got up out of bed and went over to the window, and I looked out the window, and looked up, and as I looked out the window, I looked up, and I saw, and there it was, Cygnus is just where it should be. At that point, exact moment a swan flew through the constellation and this is half one in the morning hmm? was there not two swans no no one swan one swan or one swan yeah yeah so um, and it flew st straight past it flew the swan just as I, I literally just looked out the window and said yes there it is a swan flies through it and i said that's enough i'm back on the project <laughs> because the chances of uh, a swan flying at half one in the morning through the constellation just as I looked out the window is just astronomically not... I, I don't think I've ever seen a swan fly at night time, let alone looking at the constellation that represents one. Yeah. So that was um, that got me back on the project, so that was good enough for me. Very deeply meaningful coincidences that seem to have uh, astronomical odds, <laughs> excuse the yes. pun, astronomical odds... Um, uh, and what C.G. Young in his book about synchronicity refers to as events that are not causally related. In other words, they can't have caused each other to happen. No. You got out of bed at half one in the morning thinking about Cygnus. You looked out, there it was, and as you did, the swan flew through the swan constellation. Yeah. And it just so happened at that time, we were talking quite a lot about... Uh, Ashlinga Angus, so the dream of Angus at Newgrange, the Whooper Swans and the migration and the yeah. Cygnus Enigma, which is another of the major discoveries. Now we will come back to that because I want to, uh, I want to go back to Psy Q and that synchronicity. Yeah. But at that moment, you must have been saying to yourself, "Right, if, if ever I had any doubt up to now, <laughs> it's all gone." Yes, it went out the window, literally. <laughs> <laughs> this conversation is suddenly full of puns, which I love. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah, fascinating. Uh, Jung, Jung's introduction to synchronicity, by the way, occurred when he was dealing with a patient who was telling him about a strange dream. In the dream, she told him she had dreamt of a black scarab beetle. And he thought this was very peculiar. And Jung, of course, uh, was very knowledgeable of mythology, European mythology in particular. And so he was looking for the signs in dreams that were also in mythology. And of course, he came to see that myths and dreams are sort of an extension of, or perhaps one and the same thing. As, as Campbell put it, dreams are private myths and myths are public dreams. But 
he, 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 I don't know whether he was bored listening to her or whatever, but he was up at the window and he said just at that moment he heard like a tapping, a minute tapping on the window. And he looked and there was what he said is the closest European equivalent to a scarab beetle tapping on the window as if wanting to come into the room. Amazing. And he thought this was the most peculiar thing because it was a species of beetle he'd never seen in his life and had come along at this peculiar moment when the scarab beetle had been mentioned. And that was what set him uh, down the whole rabbit hole of uh, investigating uh, synchronicity. That's fascinating. But then we were to encounter the mother of all synchronicities, which is, and, and I, I know I've, this I've is, spoken this is about it. This is coming to say Q. Yeah. When you were talking about... Uh... Well, when we were talking to Geraldine, in fairness to Geraldine Stout, she said to us, look, that's my opinion, but you really need to talk to... Professor uh, Ronald Hicks. Professor Ronald Hicks. And what did she call him? She said, he is Mr. Henge. Yes. And Professor Hicks is attached to... He's the Professor of Anthropology at Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. Now, I didn't for some reason reach out to him then because we were so busy with the whole project and we were reading so much and learning so much and making so many uh, measurements and looking at maps and doing all the stuff we were doing. And so I suppose I let it slip a little bit. And then the most extraordinary thing happened in 2005, which was five years after we had discovered or photographed and observed the potential or possible alignment of Psyche. That's so cute, yeah. What, what, what happened that day? This well, is well, summer solstice. Yeah, we, we earlier in, t- in 2005, we had, you and I, come up with the idea that we would hold a summer solstice festival at Millmount. Because we felt that... The mythological and astronomical cosmological aspects of Millmount were not being spoken about at all. Almost like, almost like, and not, I don't want to be unfair to anybody who may be listening, dead or alive. Um, <laughs> you know, that there was this intense focus at Millmount with the military and the Norman history of the place. And yet the folklore were saying, no, it's it's much older, you know, and, and it's it's got this... Uh, mythology attached to it about Amergin, the, the the spiritual, the bardic leader of the Milesians who was supposed to have been buried there. We wanted to commemorate that. Yeah. We announced it. I announced it on Mythical Ireland yeah. on the website. And of course, as is always the case, I'm a terrible organiser anyway, but you and I were just far too inundated and too engrossed in the general task of the research and at that stage of course we had decided we were going to put a book together yeah because the book would come the next year in 2006 and we decided we're going to and i announced it this summer solstice festival we had an idea to build a a gigantic a bit like a wicker man but a a gigantic figure that we're going to call amergin we were going to have him holding the sun which he does which he did apparently when he arrived in ireland and we were going to talk about the alignments and we were going to have uh, entertainment, yeah. music, dancing, painting, yeah. etc. And then the whole plan fell by the wayside. And I forgot to announce on the website that it's actually not happening. And in any case, <laughs> because we hadn't sort of drummed up a lot of interest in it locally, we hadn't announced it in the local media. But what happened that day, and that was the day of summer solstice 2005. Mm-hmm. It was a Sunday. The phone rang at home in the afternoon and it would be very unusual for my phone to ring and it for it to be anybody other than Richard Moore ringing me. <laughs> yeah. And and uh, Anne says, my wife said, the, the phone for you. I said, okay. Yeah, took the phone and said, hello. She said, hello, is this Anthony Murphy? Yes. Anthony Murphy from Mythical Ireland? Yes. And I'm in my head and I'm, going, I'm thinking, Who is this? what is this about? Yeah. And she said, I have a couple here who have travelled all the way from the Netherlands to attend the Summer Solstice Festival at Millmount. And she said, I don't know what they're talking about. (laughs) (laughs) And I was immediately intensely embarrassed. I was like, oh dear. Yes, we did announce that. I I announced it, should I say. I'll take full blame. But I had forgotten to announce its cancellation. Just as well. 
And so well, what, what emerged was she said, well, what am I going to tell them? I said, I'll tell you what to do. Tell them to hang on there and I'll come over to them. And by way of recompense, I will have a chat with them and talk to them about the mythology and the alignments. Hmm. At least give them a feeling that they haven't come all this way for no reason. Of course, it later transpired that wasn't the only reason they had come to Ireland. They were coming for the the, the Hill of Tara Summer Solstice Festival, which I think was on the next evening. Mm. Uh, So I went over and I met them. Nancy and Nick were their names. I can't remember their surnames. Young, young couple, you know. Mm. Full of the joys of life and, you know, an exuberant and and very eclectic. Uh, They were lovely people, actually. And so I got into conversation with, oh, yeah, I had phoned you. Immediately after I hung up yeah. to the lady in Millmount, I phoned you and said, Richard, bit of a problem. There's this couple who come, come <laughs> up to Millmount from the right. Netherlands for the festival. And you said, look, sure, I'll come up as well. Yeah. I was engaged in uh, enthusiastic discourse with this young couple when you arrived. And there was a couple of other people around. Mm-hmm. And you got chatting to them, wasn't that right? Yeah. You you tell you tell it a little I can't, bit. Actually, I can't remember the details. Yeah. You you. It was you who got chatting to the others, and then Rick, Ronald Hicks introduced himself to you. Yeah. And you came over to me and interrupted me uh, politely, yeah. and said, "Anthony, Mister Hange is here." Yeah. And I was like, "No way!" He said, "That's Ronald Hicks." I said, yeah. "No, no, I don't. I can't believe it." Yeah. And. Well, the rest, as they say, is history, or as I always say, the rest is prehistory. Yeah. But uh, not uh, ignoring Nancy and Nick for a second, because because we continued a lovely conversation. But I I got chatting to the aforementioned Professor Hicks, and the most extraordinary thing was that he was in Ireland as he had done every summer for many years, exploring monuments. And specifically exploring them in relation to mythology, which yeah. was fantastic. Yeah. Here was an American who was engrossed completely by monuments bought with the mythology. Mm. And, I, and, and I thought that was wonderful. The really bizarre thing was that they weren't at Millman for any reason other than that's where they had arranged to meet. I think Professor Hicks had been in Cork. Yeah. And his student, Randy, I can't remember, Randy yeah. Woolridge. Yeah. Woolridge was Randy's second name. Randy, yeah. if you're listening, a shout out to you. And I hope you remember that fateful day. They had agreed, again, no cell phones. Mm. They had agreed to meet at Millmount. That's where they were going to hook up because it is such a landmark. Yeah. Listen, you're in Cork. I'm in Belfast. Where will we meet? Professor Hicks says, tell you what, we'll meet him. Well, it's not exactly halfway, but not far off. We meet in Drogheda. There's a big mound with a Martello Tower on it overlooking the tent. You can't miss it. Go there. I'll meet you there. Mm. And he and Randy met at Millmount at the same time as you and I had come to Millmount com- almost completely by chance. We shouldn't have been there that day. It was ridiculously implausible, mm. except for it happened. Astonishingly unbelievable. Amazing. And I still maintain to this day, precisely as you said, and you have said many a time, that you one cannot help but get the impression that a hidden hand is helping you on your journey. That's right. Because at that time, remember, we had decided we were writing a book. I had a plan for a book. And what was my biggest problem? I couldn't tie up the estuary of the river and, and Millmount, this part of the Boyne Valley, with the rest, because I wanted them to meet at Douth Henge. Mm. And I had this doubt about Douth Henge. Douth. <laughs> no doubt no doubt about it. <laughs> I was doubtful. Um yes. and we absolutely needed to talk to Professor Hicks in order to progress the book. And um, By the most stunning circumstances, he arrived right to us. On a silver platter. Yeah. You couldn't, uh, you couldn't, you couldn't make this up. Yeah. It was extraordinary. And I remember the conversation because we went up into the Martello Tower and looked over the wall. And I spoke to him about the alignments that we had seen. The winter alignment with Tara and the importance of the link there between Tia the wife of Eremon and Amergin, having 
being guarantor for where she would be buried and where the kings would rule from at Tara. That's a solstice alignment. The equinox alignment with slain. Mm. And then the summer solstice alignment into the Black Hill. The Black Hill when the darkness of the, the winter is going to start coming back again. And I was pointing these things. And I remember being very impressed when I said to Professor Hicks that, you know, the modern interpretation of these things is full of sort of uh, arcane and archaic terminology. But at the end of the day, if the sun sets into that hill, it sets into that hill. Mm. And it's very easy to commemorate that in a myth. Um, And so because he was going on an onward journey, I said to him, can we communicate? And he said, absolutely. Here's my email address. Feel free to email me. And when I come back to the States, we'll engage in a a discourse. And that's what happened. And that's when he told me, oh, yeah. Oh, sure. When I told him about Site Q, he said, oh, yeah. I, I wrote as much in a paper in 1985. I'll send it to you. And he sent it to me. I still have it. I still have it to this day and his handwritten notes to say that he suspected in 1985 that the gaps of Douth Henge were aligned on summer solstice sunrise and winter solstice sunset. And furthermore, and more importantly, he had said in the paper, there there is apparently some doubt about the northeastern entrance. He said, while it does look like it was mucked about at some stage, he was coming down on the side of he was leaning towards the belief that it was absolutely part of the uh, contemporary with the original structure. And that was how Island of the Setting Sun, as a vision, became complete yeah. by the most extraordinary set of coincidences. Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, you say you mentioned Ball State University. <clears throat> yeah, there's another connection. Yeah, so Robert Stowell Ball was the chief astronomer of both England and Ireland back in the 1860s and 70s. It was the Royal Observatory at Greenwich, was it? Yes, that's... Yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, Ball's Grove, which, which is, is on the hill dry. next to Just Mill across Mount. the way from Millmount. Yeah. By the way, you're looking across Ball's Grove estate to the Hill of Slane for that's the Equinox right. Sunset. That's right. That's the same family. Uh, George Washington's mother was a ball from that family. Wow. You know, if you have, you know, Balls Bridge in Dublin? Yeah. That's the same family. I didn't realise that. Yeah. And Actually, I know Starwell, you told me this before. Yeah, and Sir Robert Starwell Ball wrote two books that I have here from the 1870s. He wrote uh, a treatise on, on astronomy, I know that much, yeah. yeah. Um, Fascinating. He was very well regarded in his time, wasn't he? He was, yeah. I mean, he was just a head, a head man. Mm. But, uh, Interesting to have and, all those connections. And were the Ball family associated with Ball State University? Yeah. I don't know that. I'm not 100% yeah. sure. Imagine now, if that turns out to be the case, that's, that makes it even more interesting. It, it would, actually, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised, to I be haven't, honest. I've never looked into that, so I'm not sh- I can't say it is or it isn't, so I don't yeah. know. But, um, uh, so Robert, so the, the Ball family, yes. Just think if George Washington's mother was a Ball. One of that family. Yeah. Yeah, that's extraordinary. Yeah, so you're actually looking across the old estate of Ballsgrove is now a housing estate because the land was purchased from the Ball family in I think the 1950s or the 1960s by the then Drogheda Corporation who 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 built a huge public housing estate on it. That's by the way, my wife is from Ballsgrove that's, and mine. And you, your, your wife was from Ballsgrove. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> So so here you go, uh, just talking about the coincidences. Is, so yeah. in this way, the project, which we, we could call Island of the Setting Sun, took on mythical proportions, didn't yeah. it? It was, it was mythological, really, wasn't it? It seems so. It was far more than just measuring and describing and investigating. There was this whole other aspect to it. What is a spiritual element? A magical, the whole thing. spiritual, nuministic, transcendent, whatever you want to call it, coincidental. There's a whole other side to it which which, which basically defies logic. Hmm. So there. I say, so put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, in, in tandem with all that, of course, um, Baltray and Douth were the two sort of big 
discoveries or the contributions as it were to uh, a wider understanding of the landscape and the wider it i suppose it it extended the belief among the academics certainly was that new grange was absolutely designed to capture the solstice sunrise but it didn't they didn't really take the doubt sunset too seriously because i think partly because brennan had discovered it martin brennan was a figure of not hate but a figure of derision among the archaeologists because he had clashed with them so much when he was in Ireland. And I think it was Anne-Marie Moroni's um, observations at Douth that actually are the ones that are referred to in the archaeological texts because she spent several winters observing it very carefully and photographing (coughs) it. But in tandem with all that, sorry, I was getting off the track there a little bit, we also had the Cygnus Enigma. We've spoken of the Cygnus Enigma. We've spoken about the swans. And how you had seen the swans in the fields of Newgrange Farm in the 80s. But yeah. but what was it that brought the Cygnus Enigma together? Well, oh, of course, God. the very first conversation we had yes. in January of 1990 right. in the Drahad Independent, yes. you asked the question, could, could that be Cygnus amongst those markings on the stone? Yeah. Uh, it's just, uh, see, it was, all, it was all speculation then, because... These things were what looked like. That's what they looked like. It was the nearest thing that made any sense. What was on them. It's, I see, it's too long ago now. I can't really remember the details. You know, you know when you get, you jump into the sea and you sort of, you know, not a lot of water about you. You kind of, it's hard to pick out. Yeah. Key moments um, that, Led from one thing to another. All in, uh, it's all a kind of a, a hazy thing now. Well, I can remember distinctly, Richard, and I don't mind prompting you, but yeah. you told me, perhaps as early as 1999, you told me, isn't it interesting that the Whooper Swans come to Newgrange? And you had spoken to a local ornithologist who told you that Newgrange was an important wintering ground. That's right, yeah. And that, in addition to that, there was this very significant swan myth pertaining to Newgrange oh, after yeah, yeah. Ingersoll <clears throat> well uh, yeah when um, the swans arrived at Aaron Macca they well they say white birds they don't specifically say swans yeah so but there were big white birds that landed on the ground and they were eating everything around them so the Conor McNessa and his boys chased them away but they ended up ch- chasing them all the way down to Newgrange so this was the connection between Arma uh, and his uh, sister was with him. Yeah, or in some Dext- in some Dextiny. versions it's his daughter, but it's it's his sister, I think. Yeah, Dexterne. Yeah. Now, when they arrive, they there's a they, they're greeted by a couple who bring them inside and they have a big drinking session. Now, the the, the wife of the cop the the wife is um, pregnant, heavily pregnant, uh, but after a hard night's drinking, the the wife uh, gives birth to a baby boy. And the mayor gave birth to two foals, which later became the the horses of the chariots. It almost uh, sounds a little bit like a way in a manger. Yes, it is. It's a, it's a, you see, they also mentioned that there was um, snow on the ground, I think. Yeah, correct. And that means it was in winter. It was winter. So you have a a, a mysterious birth. At, yeah, they, At Newgrange. Yeah. In the winter. In the winter, yeah. Involving... Presaged by the swans, yeah. You say white birds, yes, but like they're almost certainly swans. They were eating up all the grass out of yeah. our maca. It's yeah. what swans do, you know. Yeah. yeah. So um, these connections are they stand out, and then when you see it in, in the actual life, where the, where the birds are actually there, still, still, still arriving at Newgrange in the winter, um, you do have to ask questions, you know. You know, there's more to the story than, you know, than has been said, you know. But you you had the whole hypothesis already sort of um, summarised because you also, at that stage, you also pointed out to me the cross shape of the constellation and oh, how yeah. it was reflected in the design of the cruciform chamber of Newgrange. You yeah. pointed that out to me. Yeah. And it even has the bend in it. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's all there, yeah. Um, it's so long ago now, you know. 
Yeah, I've been away from this for quite a while, so I haven't really been... I'm not as fresh in memory of the details as I was then. So trying to remember everything in the order they came in yeah. is, is quite difficult. But then, then we went to Four Knocks. Yeah. Oh, yeah and, yeah. and and that was another intuitive journey, wasn't it? Yeah. It was the, like we went there with the expectation of finding something significant. And I, I know that's hardly the scientific method. And people would be saying you were just trying to find affirmation of your theory and you'll find it any way you want. It's it's like a hunch. It's like something, just something in the pattern mm. stands out. And when something in the pattern stands out, you have to ask yourself, what's going on here? Why is that not quite the way it should be? So that leads you to look a little closer at that point. And then when you start to open it up, you begin to see all these, um, uh, what would you call it? connections? Yes. Um, yeah. When we went to Four Knox, we were a bit perplexed about the direction it faced because yes. it was just 14 degrees off north which meant the sun or the moon couldn't shine in there That's upon right. rising but it did point to Cygnus rising mm. and that was that was another connection now when you're in Newgrange and you you say you drive out and hold that angle as you travel it hits four knocks at the winter solstice so sunrise. So the range is yeah. pointing to four knocks. Exactly. And then four knocks is pointing to the Cygnus rising. Yeah. Is it rising or Saturn? No, it's rising. Yeah. It's Deneb rising, the bright star, the tail of the hen. Yeah. Um, and, and this is where precession of the equinoxes first came into our, our view because Cygnus is effectively circumpolar in Ireland. That's right. For almost the entirety of the cycle of precession, which lasts approximately 26,000 years is 25,920 years but there's just this one era lasting a century or maybe two when it actually sets Deneb sets very briefly it sort of scrapes along the horizon disappears for a little bit and then rises again and that was the era in which Newgrange and, and probably Knox. Fornox they're probably contemporary yeah so Fornox is pointing to that significant rising point yeah. of Deneb yeah, and so that was a bingo moment, wasn't yeah. it? Now, if it wasn't for the coincidence of mm. things happening or mm. patterns sticking out a little bit out of sync with everything else, they wouldn't have noticed that. Now, why would you? Build, you know, it's the question was why were they building a passage pointing to something that has neither solar or lunar? Yeah, it had to be something else. And the fact that it happened to be Cygnus was was quite significant. Some experts would say maybe it's not pointing at anything astronomical. Well, if they want to go with that, then they might miss something. So you have to look at these things and see if there's something there. And if there's nothing there, well, then they're right. But if there is something there, well, then let's have a look further at that. Yeah, but that was adduced through the mythology. And, of course, again, uh, most of the scholars would say that uh, mythology is not proof of anything because you can't tell well first of all there are two things and I'm, I'm only just playing devil's advocate here yeah. as I always do two things first of all that you don't know the age of the myth you don't know from when it comes it could be it was written down in the middle ages by mm. Christian monks it might have only been a century old at that stage the other thing is that we don't know that the ancient Irish saw that cross shape as a swan we have no way of proving that Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we will find it. <laughs> if, there, if, it's, if it's there, we'll find it. You know, eventually. Or yeah. somebody else will. Um, but, and then even furthermore was this mystery about... Can I just put, sorry, a, you put can, a little point in there about, about storytelling? Hmm. Uh, Victor Buckley was telling us about a site that the local legend had it that there was a headless warrior buried in the mound. Victor Buckley, the archaeologist. Yes. Former National Monument Service archaeologist. Yeah. yeah. Now, he was telling me that they were doing this site and it hadn't been touched in 4,000 years. But the local story was this headless warrior was buried there. So when they excavated the site, um, they found a body with no head. Now... <laughs> That's amazing because the story can last that long. 
What was, what, if you don't mind me asking, what was Victor Buckley's opinion about the correlation of the myth and archaeology? Was he supportive of it or dismissive of it? Or what, what was his view of it? Um, I mean, what were the I, chances? Well, he, it was him that told me the story, mm. emphasising the, the, the importance yeah. of the story being correct. What would have been the chances of finding a headless body in a mound such as that, dating to that? What was it? Was that a Bronze Age mound, was it? Or? Oh, that would be 4,000. Oh, that's Bronze Age, yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't I, particularly know, but probably, no. prob- probably, you generally don't find headless. But uh, in, it's long before the Middle Ages started writing stuff down, so the story held its course mm. all through those, all through that time. It must have been refreshing for you to hear an archaeologist saying something like that. Well, especially Victor Buckley, you know, like, uh, he's 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 on the button, you know. The man who rediscovered Ireland, Stonehenge. Thank you. Mm. Yes, I didn't know it was him. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, well. He, 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 he had exa- He was looking through the old Cambridge University aerial images, and he found one from I think it was taken in the nineteen sixties or seventies, and yeah. there were crop marks in the field, and he, 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 he was able to correlate that with Wright's drawing from seventeen forty eight of Ireland. What, what Victor. I think he came up with the terminology Ireland's Stone Stone Age because it had been completely wiped away. This giant monument, uh, fascinating. So, um, so this is this is where the importance of storytelling has kept its um, course all down through the centuries. I think um, I was saying to you before. I think we're like, um, you know, like a relay race. The baton is handed down to each runner. Now you can imagine each runner has been a different century. The story passed on from generation to generation. It's like a relay race, okay? Yeah, brilliant analogy. So yeah. when it got to us, we decided to, well, let's have a look inside the baton and see if there's any clues or documents talking about this. You know, let's have a look at the yeah. what they're handing down. This is the story. So we just opened up the story to see if there's any astronomical references or other archaeological references to this story about that place. So this is that would be my analogy of it. So whereas people handed it down literally exactly the way it was told from the beginning. Say for instance, you know if you're reading the child a bedtime story and you've read it a hundred times and you're getting fed up reading the same story <laughs> <laughs> and you say ah she's she's half asleep. I I'll, I'll skip a bit. And the next thing, you go on to the next, no, you left out a bit there. <laughs> <laughs> that type of thing. Yeah. So the storytelling is has the same strength. But also, too, I believe that it's easier to remember a story than a long mathematical equation. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. It's much easier. If you wanted to encode information about yeah. uh, topography or geography and your journey along the rivers, or, for instance, if you wanted to encode information about the sky... Yeah. The easiest way to do it is, is tell, tell a story, story about it. Yeah. It's a mnemonic, is what they call it. It's okay. an, e- an easy way to remember complex information. Yeah. Well, easy. <laughs> Depends on how you define easy. Of course, yeah. re- remember that... Uh, it's like long, the, long, long um, ballads. You know the way mm. these people can, like Christy Moore and all them, singing these Yeah. Yeah. long, complex story ballads. Just well, the, the olives, the poets of medieval Ireland had to memorize serious amounts of 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 uh, work before they could oh. complete their training, and their training lasted for years. Oh, it was about seven or fourteen years, I think. So at least, yeah, yeah. it was a ridiculous long period of time. Almost like studying medicine. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so th- that's that's what I'm saying. The importance of the story is there, you know, like the. Um, not to be dismissed lightly. No. At all. And we were finding that, weren't we? Because uh, it seemed, it was frustrating to an extent to find archaeological texts that didn't refer to mythology. On the other hand, there were certain voices that were were affirming. Geraldine Stout sticks out. She investigated the Dunchemicus tracts about Brunibonia and tried to identify the names of the monuments from the Dunchemicus, which was lovely to see. It's lovely to see where an archaeologist is actually talking about mythology and, and, and trying to extrapolate. In in later years, um, John Waddell has done a certain amount of work around investigating mythology with regards to archaeological evidence. And the likes of, for instance, um, 
uh, J.P. Mallory in Queen's University. Um, and who am I trying to think of? There's there's one um, that has uh, been very important. Yeah, John Carey, who is actually a, a medieval scholar. Okay. When I read his, he, he has a paper from the 1990s called, I think it's called uh, 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 something about time and the boy necropolis. I can't remember the exact title of it. Mm-hmm. And he pointed out something which lit my eyes up massively and made the hair stand on the back of my head, which was that the myths associated with the great monuments of the Boyne seemed to have a concern with the dilation of time, the control of time, specifically the legend of doubt and Mm. the king's sister casting a spell on the sun to make it stand still and the Dagda casting a spell on, on Elkmar so that one day, so that nine months would be like one day. Yeah. And also the fact that some of the myths pertaining to Newgrange indicated before the excavations, the myths and the folk beliefs indicated functions of Newgrange that couldn't have been known before the excavations. Yeah. So the conclu- the only co- sort of the immediate natural conclusion to reach, and of course, I know that there are different voices in this discussion, but the immediate natural conclusion to reach is that well, if the archaeologists say Newgrange was buried for 4,000 years and nobody knew that it, there was a chamber in there, then if the stories prove the original design of the monument, then the stories have to be at least 4,000 years old. Exactly. Exactly. And then you're into a totally different realm. You're into a realm where you cannot dismiss any story about any monument because no. you have to assume that that story... First of all, as you say, exactly like the relay race, the baton has been passed from generation to generation over many, many centuries. But secondly, that that story has a real vitality and a real meaning, a kernel of truth in it. Mm -hmm. It's not just a fable. It's more than that. No, it's it's good that um, people are looking at this now and taking the stories a little more seriously now. So that means... The preservation of those stories now has gone up a level. Mm-hmm. You know, now now we're beginning to understand our folklore is actually very important. Yeah. So, see, so you're raising the status of not little fairy stories to science um, level. So that's that's what well, I'm. This, about. I'm going to say something now, Richard. This was your crucial role for me in the whole Island of the Setting Sun project. Not just your meticulous artist's eye and the way that you could read the landscape. That was remarkable. But more importantly, you were the one that told me. I mean, you told me the three swan stories of Newgrange. Mm. There was Ashlinga Angus, Angus and Care. Mm-hmm. There was uh, Dechtene and Conor McNessa mm-hmm. arriving at Newgrange chasing the swans. And the other one that you reminded me of was... Uh, Tukmark Etain because in Tukmark Etain uh, Midger and Etain in one of the three stories had transformed into swans and flown out through the right. smoke hole at Tara yeah. but she had been minded at Newgrange for a period by Angus inside uh-huh. the sunny bower the crystal bower which is a fascinating description Yes, which seems out of place if you didn't know that Newgrange has a chamber illuminated by the sun once That's a year. Correct. Isn't that That's fascinating, correct, yeah. isn't it? It is, yeah. No, but you're... I have to, accent, I have to re- really uh, accentuate this for the listeners. You brought that stuff to my attention. You sparked that in me, that interest in mythology. And from then... I mean, we're here 22 years later. You say it's a long time ago and, you know, you haven't been actively... I have never... I have, I have just engrossed myself entirely in it since then. Thanks be to God. <laughs> yeah, but but uh, um, driven by your initial enthusiasm and knowledge. Well, somebody has to light a fire to spark it off. But if it's sparked in me by my father and other people and other, watching other people doing these things and telling their stories, just, I just have a, a curiosity about... Where things come from. Yeah. 
<clears throat> who are we, where we come from, all that type of stuff. Trying to make sense of Trying to make sense of, of, of why things are. Um, and just before we kind of move <coughs> off that whole Cygnus thing, one more thing that was very important was your question. Again, that was asked around possibly 2003, 2004. You said to me, why was St. Patrick drawing the eyes of the King Lyra oh, away yeah. from Tara towards Slane? Yeah. And that question, which you asked not knowing the answer and not having any preconception or, uh, uh, you know, uh, determined uh, 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 conclusion. You asked that, knowing intuitively, I think, that that would yield fruit. <laughs> and the fruit that that yielded, by the way, in relation to Cygnus, was that Again, at the... Again, see, that's a pattern. It's a, it's a slip. It's a pattern that's just not... It's not flowing. It's, it, there's something, there's a kink in this. You know, why is that there? It's, it, is it not just, I mean, <coughs> I'm just, again, playing devil's advocate. Yeah. Is it not just the case that Patrick wanted to light the Paschal fire at a site other than the pagan site of kingship? No. I no, think, because uh, he lit it at Slane, which was a pagan site, yeah. the burial place of the Fir Bullock King yeah. Sl- Slania. And the Paschal. The, the the equinox, you know this um, Easter, yeah, the balance. Mm. This is where <clears throat> the Christian believe when when Jesus was was crucified on Golgotha, it was directly west of the temple. And in the Old Testament, it talks about I will remove sin as far as the east is from the west. In other words, the balance is paid. Mm. So this is about the balance. Of the day and the night, of the dark and the the dark part of the year and the light part of the year. This is the balance. So everything is healed, and it's all about healing as yeah. well. So we had slain in our sights from Millmount, yeah, for the equinox, and we had it in our sights from Tara. You asked me that question several times mm. over the course of a year. Why was the king? And I was like, Richard, why are you asking me that question? And then eventually, not only did we draw the line on the map and found there was an alignment of sights. Yeah. Uh, Tara the Mount of the Hostages at Tara and the Hill of Slain Mound and the Barrow Cemetery at Mount Oriel and one of the mounds upon Rail Tope were all in the line yeah. but then when I looked at the astronomy ah oh, the moment Patrick lit the Paschal fire at dusk on the evening of well it doesn't actually matter the year because the stars wouldn't change from yeah. year to year on the evening of March the 26th 432 AD or 433 AD, depending on which history you read, mm-hmm. Cygnus mm-hmm. is rising directly above the fire, with the fire almost beneath the centre star. No, that's some that's some coincidence. <clears throat> some layers. So if you go back to the moment when you were saying, I want a sign. Yeah. I'll have a look at where Cygnus is at half one in the morning. And the swan flew through Cygnus. Just to so that the reader or the listener, should I say, understands the the extreme relevance of that, the mm. very pertinent relevance of that, is that because of your questioning and your knowledge of the uh, mythology, we went on to make several, what I think are important discoveries. They opened up more doors, uh, better understanding. To the. You know, our history is so rich. Mm. We d- it can easily g- get lost if we don't emphasise how important these things are. And yeah. finding out how important they are is crucial to keeping them alive. A hundred percent, yeah. So we won't lose it. Yeah. So that's all. Correct. And so, Richard, any discussion about Island of the Setting Sun is incomplete without some mention of probably its most mysterious aspect which is the high man and I want to start by asking you a question you know which the sceptics will always answer will, will, sorry will always ask which is is it not the case that this giant figure of a man or a human or a god or a giant or a warrior 
that you found in the landscape is just an entirely accidental arrangement of roads and features. Um, it shouldn't be there, but it is. It's it's laid out in conjunction with all the sites at each part. Where Amagan is buried at Millmount is the knee part of the figure. Where Slain is, is the other knee. They're both sitting on the Boyne River. When you go up to Cullen, it's where the three giants are buried. There's the belt part of the figure. When you move up to RD, that's the head part. The mound is Cashel Guhard, the mound of the high voice, that's where the forehead is. And where Ferdia was killed by Cuhullan is on the crown of the head. Um, and the name of the neck area is called Hunter's Town, Orion the Hunter. Um, there's a lot of coincidence. Mm. Yeah. And t- to get from one megalithic site to another, you need to know where you're going. So these old roads seem to line up with that. Now, I didn't put the figure there. The figure was, is already there. Now, by sheer coincidence, on so many levels, between the ages of the mound and their location to each other is all coincidental. But they do happen to line up significantly with astronomical events as well. Plus the local folklore sitting on top of it as well. Uh, in case, Amigan's, with the knee part of the figure, Amigan's full name is Amigan of the Bright Knee. And that mill mount itself is um, connecting with Slane and Crow Patrick. And mill mount is connected with the winter saucer sunset and summer saucer sunrise to Tara. And then if you continue the line on through t- Tara, you, it brings you to the well. The, the source of the Boyne, so it's a straight line, so, and it's also winter solstice sunset. So, yeah, there's a lot of coincidence. Uh, I can't say it's, 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 it's there. I can't say it's not there because it is. So it's up to the people to interpret for themselves whether it's. Yeah, because you can, you can extrapolate or extract images from road maps. But much more difficult is to correlate all that with yeah. astronomy and monuments and, of course, the mythology and the place yeah. names. Yeah. So I think when people see it and read the information about each place and their connection to all the other places, they can make up their own mind. It's. I'm not saying it is there or it isn't, but for me, it's quite... It's there, I can't say it isn't. You know, it's not... Um, I don't know. I, I, yeah, you have to see it to believe it. Yeah. I, I don't really know how to argue um, that with people who don't believe it, uh, or they have some doubts about it. I think the more you read about it and the more you see it, the more it seems to be quite convincing. I don't really have any doubts about it, but I don't. Um, I don't want to impose a theory. It's up to the. It's up to the listeners if they want to examine it more. Yeah. Could it be the case that it's one of those extremely meaningful coincidences? Yeah. The. I don't know whether to go into the Egyptian part of this, but. Um, it's if you look at the the Egyptian aspect of Orion and its um, shape, and you often see those figures on the the walls that have a, these images of a warrior holding uh, in that pose. Um, it's very similar to the the high man figure. Now mm. the high man figure doesn't have an upright arm, but where loud villages is where this, the upright hand would be. 
and in, interesting enough, low villages where there was a sun worshipping cult in that place. So uh, the hand of Orion where the sun passes through once a year, but most significantly now, it's on the winter, I'll oh, sorry, the summer solstice that he holds us just for that day. Yeah. And this is a once in 26,000 year event. Yeah. Uh, that it should happen to fall on the solstice. It did so when the Milesians arrived, it did so on the 1st of May, which was again a very significant date in Irish mythology. So when you start putting all these pieces together, it makes more yeah. sense and relevance to the area. Yeah, just just for the the listeners, so they understand the date given for the arrival of the Milesians. Um, was it sixteen forty nine or sixteen ninety four? Well, it's sixteen ninety four. But actually, I've realised in recent years that there is a six year correlation. It's actually around seventeen hundred BC, uh, and that doesn't actually detract at all from the cosmology because. What happens is, according to the date of the arrival of the Milesians, which is Bialtana, in around 1700 BC, when you look at what the stars were doing, that was the day in which the sun was in the hand of Orion. Mm. And here's Amrigan, the barge and the astronomer. You know, who but I knows the place where the sun sets? Who but I knows the ages of the moon? What land is better than this island of the setting sun? The reason, and I've said this, on occasion recently and it's wonderfully brilliant the imagery is fabulous the reason Amrigan knows where the sun sets is because as Orion he carries it to the place where it sets That's right. on that day he carries it from the rising to the setting they come from the east that day they had originally landed in Inverskane in Kerry mm -hmm. but have, having met McCool, McKecht and McGrania at Tara they agreed to go back out to sea their second landing, which is the important one, was at Inverculpa on the estuary of the Boyne. Amrigan places his right foot on the shore and makes his, his song, his pronunciation, and successfully takes Ireland from the Tua de Danon at that moment. And as he does so, standing, as it were, with one foot on the shore of the Boyne, like the high man figure does, he, he proclaims this these words. Um, and... He, he is literally as well, better, uh, symbolically, uh, as Orion. He's carrying the sun, the the keeper of the light. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at the Statue of Liberty, he's holding up a light. It's, it's a similar sort of symbolism. Or as you used to say to me, the Olympic torch bearer. Yes, that's another one. The one who carries the light is what, not the one who would be king. Because Eremon and e e Eber fought out uh, amongst themselves. Eremon was to become the first king. Don, being the eldest, had died. Mm. He should have assumed the kingship. Amrigan is not the one who will lead politically. He is the spiritual figurehead. And he is the one that negotiates directly with the tutelary or guardian goddesses, Banba, Fola and Eru. And it is through the agreement of Eru that the Milesians take Ireland. Yeah. Uh, and I happen to think that that is excessively significant. Yes, it's... It's quite a... It's, it's a strange um, thing. It's a strange figure, at, especially at this time. At this age... It has more significance now because this is the apex. This is the highest Orion will be for the next 26,000 years. And on the day of summer solstice, in this epoch, Orion carries the sun across the sky. On the sun's highest day, Orion carries it from its rising to its setting. How, how unusual is that? Well, it's one in 26,000 year coincidence, I suppose. Or They say, you know, it's it's like a giant clock. Yeah. And, you know, it's midnight on that clock. 
um, okay, we're dealing in 24 yeah. hour clocks rather yeah. than 12 hours. If you had 24 hours on the clock rather than 12. But, you know, after this, Orion begins to sink again. Mm-hmm. Now, it's not the sort of thing that you or I need to worry about because it's not going to happen in our lifetime. But in half of the cycle, half of the cycle's time, in 13,000 years from now, Orion will have sunk so low from Ireland as to be all but invisible, except for that upraised arm that you spoke about a couple of moments ago. Wow. The the bright part of the constellation, the stars, Betelgeuse and Bellatrix and the Bell stars and Rigel, etc. I think the other leg is Sif, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Uh, they will they will not rise. They'll be below the horizon at all times. To see Orion in 13,000 years' time, you will have to go to much more southerly latitudes. Yeah. But conversely, right now, it is at the absolute top. It's at the apex. And that coincides, coincidentally, with the revelation of this figure. This and the landscape. What can you say about that? It's well, I think it's hit coincidence heaped upon coincidence, but it's meaningful coincidence. It's not random coincidence. It's it's no. imbued with meaning because the figure has so much associations with the monumental architecture of the region uh, and the mythology of the area. It is intimately associated with the figures. And their stories um, are reflected in the figure in some way. Yeah, especially Cúhollán. And some of the place names as well. Yes, it's it's a it's a big um, it's it's almost it's unbelievable. It shouldn't be there, but it is. That that's what I keep saying. Is it a is, is it a sign of some sort being told to us about this era? Is there something about to reveal itself to all mankind? Is it a sign to say, you know, whatever it is, pay attention. There's a big change about to happen. I don't know. It's interesting that you should mention that because... The big change that happened in Lower Gowala and, you know, the Denshanicus, sorry, yes, or the Annals, should I say, record it. The big change that happened when the sun was in the hand of Orion at Pialtana in the Bronze Age was that the Milesians took over Ireland from the Tuatha de Danann, a very significant mythological event. Mm. A changing of, a changing of... A whole way of life. <laughs> The, the the deities gave way to the mortals. Yes. Now maybe it's time that the mortals gave way to the the spiritual realm that's coming back. And even that's interesting because of the the widespread folk belief uh, in the return of the two of the Danon. Yeah. Uh that's the Garrett's Fort thing. That and and other myths, yeah. Free Ireland from its burden of oppression. It's yeah. I do, I don't know about the the listeners. This is it's it's very deep stuff. It's not um. It's not um. It's it's sort of a. There's like some huge spiritual change going on, or at least the signs are, but whether that happens or not, I don't know. But the other way you can start, oh, this is a sign for this and this is a sign for that, may not happen. But certainly the signs are there. But what, whether, what would it signify specifically, do you think, or do you have any ideas about that? Well, having, having gone through it for so many years now, I, it, I looked at the Egyptian Book of the Dead and the similarity between um, this figure and the Egyptian figures 
there seems to be some sort of... Um, it's to do with the resurrection of the dead. Now, what exactly they mean by that in this time, I don't know. See, I can't... I, I don't really know the answer. I don't know what this is. It's probably out there for someone else to discover what the answer is. Well, even that's interesting because... You know, the whole belief that the two at Anon are going to return could be viewed as the resurrection of those who have gone from this world to another world. Um, but the, the it, only other similarity I've come across is in the book of Revelations, where it talks about an angel who rises in the east holding, the, holding a seal in his hand, and he has one foot in the sea and one foot in the land. And that uh, is is very similar to what this figure is and it 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 what it rises where the sun rises anyway and they, they mentioned that too so I, i'm not sure the exact uh, line in the in the web book of revelations it is but um maybe at some later date we can look it up but it has that symbolism so, but that's end times, but not necessarily the end of the world, but it, it it's a change that, that's about to happen. And this is like a, a, a sign about, of that about to happen. But that's, again, we're, we're talking about stuff that I'm, I can't really be sure of. Yeah, well, I think that's the biggest, um, I think that's the most important aspect of this, is the uncertainty around it and in fact you know about my own uncertainty around it I've come to view it and that's why I asked as an extraordinary sort of set of coincidences that resonates on such a deep level with the mythology and the monuments and the place names of the area that one would be uh, rem- it would be remiss of me anyway to dismiss it out of hand. Maybe it could be like the the Mayan calendar thing, where they all thought the world was going to end at the end of two thousand or whatever it was. But this could be just another form of a clock that they were using, you know, to, to mark time, and it could be just as simple as that, and nothing more. It's just a, a huge symbol of one clock depicting long periods of time using Orion as the the main figure, maybe. Yeah, but I don't. I get the impression from the way you say that that you don't actually believe that. No, not really. <coughs> <laughs> it's just all the other stuff that. When you put all the strange coincidences and spooky coincidences together, it, this is a little more than just a clock thing. It seems to it seems to resonate on a spiritual level quite deeply, and um, I think there seems to be some sort of now is the time. If we got if something is, is about to happen or is happening or a huge change is about to take place, but that's. That's just speculation on my behalf. Yeah, and 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 that sounds like an astrological uh, standpoint. That you know, it's written in the stars. Fate, yeah, you know, occurs according to changes in the heavens, great events, well, foretold or portended or foreshadowed by what's going on in the sky. Okay, well, as a Christian now, I would, I would, I refer to the Star of Bethlehem, which I was, I'd mentioned to you earlier. Um, I was curious about what, what the wise men were seeing. We've all heard about this giant um, glowing orb or star that was seen in the sky that was um, talking about the Messiah's arrival, and the wise men were, had followed the star. So all the picture postcards you see is this big luminous star in the sky. But when I was reading the the New Testament about the birth of Jesus, I thought it was curious as to why Herod and his men didn't notice anything in the sky. Because when the wise men arrived to say, we pay, we're here to pay homage to the, the new king, 
he didn't know what they were on about. And he said, what are you talking about? Oh, we saw his star. So it meant that Herge and the people in Jerusalem didn't see anything in the sky that was, a, 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 that was unusual. So that made me see, sort of think, so why, why not? You know, what's going on here? And so I read up a little bit more on it as to what they meant by his star, and it, it pointed to being Jacob's star. So I decided to go and look a bit, go back a little bit and read about Jacob. So there's a story about uh, Jacob wrestling with the angel, but it's actually God he's wrestling with. And he's sitting uh, at a ford crossing, and he sends his wives and uh, maidens over, and I think it's his cattle, he sends them on over ahead, but he stays at this part at night. And then God comes along and wrestles with him. And then um, he's getting the better of God in the wrestling match, and God taps him on the hip and knocks his hip out of joint. Now, this story, when I was reading it, it looked so familiar because I'd been reading a lot about Cuchulain in the town. Yeah. And Cuchulain seems to be have these great battles taking place at ford crossings. River, river fords, yeah. And in our uh, research with Cuchulain, he's he's actually Orion. Um, I'll explain that in a minute. But the story was so similar, I thought, you know, Jacob star is Orion. So I had a look at the rising and setting points of stars in Orion. And now Mintaka, the hip star, the one that was knocked out of joint, is actually rising due east and setting due west. So it's almost that's like right. the balance is now about to be paid. Well, that's interesting because uh, something, yeah. sorry, yeah. I've just realised is Orion's at his apex and the summer solstice sun at its highest point is being held by Orion, you could yes. say. It's... But his belt star, the mm. one, so there are three belt stars, but Mintaka is the one that is slightly misaligned with the other, so it's not exactly a straight belt. Which is Jacob's hip. And that's rising and setting due east and due, and due, due west. west. Yeah, interesting. So, And what was all that to do with Irish mythology, though? Well, this is where the Cuchulain story, fighting um, at the ford crossing, and because I know that Cuchulain is, is, is the Orion symbol in the stories... But uh, where was I going with this? Yeah. It was just that the two stories, structurally, they're similar. And they take place in a similar situation. And the, it's the wrestling, i.e. the fighting, taking place at a ford crossing. And the fact that he even mentioned specifically the hip being knocked out of place, which Orion's belt stars, Mintaka is slightly offline. And... Um, it was also the time where Jacob's name was changed to Israel. So that again, it was a huge. That was a huge um, change mm. in Jewish uh, history. Yeah, the, the birth name of Israel. So this is where it gets kind of interesting. What was Cuchulain's most famous fight at a ford? Uh, he was fighting a fellow called Loch. No, 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 no. Sorry, okay. before you go on to that, yeah. his most famous battle. At a river ford, it was with Ferdia. Ferdia, of course. What yeah. does Ferdia's name mean? Man. God, man. Uh, oh God! Oh God! Yes. <laughs> oh Look, God! Uh, so, uh, just Stop for the man. listeners, oh my God, Richard's yeah. face just completely changed there. Oh wow! The moment of revelation. <laughs> well done, Anthony. That's, I had yeah. never These are the coincidences. That. These are the things we've been talking about oh, that have wow. been happening for years. That's so strange. He wrestles and fights with Ferdia for three days and three nights at the ford um, at the River D, which, as you say, marks yeah. the northern extremity of the head of the figure. That's right. Extraordinary stuff, yeah. God, man, oh. or man of God. That's right, yeah. Ferdia. And Ferard, which is the name of the area, pardon which me, is, means the high name, man. Which is bounded by the River D and the River Boyne. The D to the north and the Boyne to the south. And oh. if you picture Cuchulain fighting as he does at his best in ford water at, at a river, the high man is standing in a river. That's right. It's it's wonderful. The, the symbolism is, is And is the really idea stark. that he could be up to his knees in the river because it's shallow crossing. It's not a deep water crossing. Yeah. 
And of course, Millmount overlooks the ancient Ford of Drogheda. That's right. It is directly above it. Yeah. Where St. Mary's, the aforementioned Bailey Bridge that you mentioned earlier. Yeah. And St. Mary's Bridge. That's where the Ford was located Originally, before yeah. the bridge, before the first bridges were built. Interesting. Okay, so I interrupted you and you were going to tell me about Loch. Yeah, Loch was um, uh, a, a, a serious um, foe against Fru Holland. But it, they asked where, you know, where they want to fight. And he said in the ford, in the quarter, which was Fru Holland's best position to fight on. This is where he uses the gay bulga to finish him off. The gay bulga is the but, magic barbed spear that he yeah. uses underwater, throwing it with his foot. But he, he has already annoyed the Morrigan beforehand uh, in an earlier encounter. And so she comes as a, a hornless red heifer and disturbs him during the fight by crossing over. And he gets wounded in that. And then, but he breaks her foreleg. And then she comes uh, as an eel in another one. Oh, no, uh, yeah, an eel is wrapped around his leg, so he, he does something, he damages her then. And then the third one was... Um, you did say you didn't like uh, eels. Grey she-wolf. The she-wolf, uh, the yeah. Grey, the grey she-wolf, is, which is similar to the, the, the Gemini thing, which has got the wolf, the wolves, you know, if you think of Romulus and Remus and Rome, Aye, and yeah. all that connection there. So you have, that's in Oregon, which is above Orion. So... You have the three, if the three uh, constellations, you have Taurus as a hornless red heifer, and then you have the grey she wolf, which is our origa above that, and then you have the eel un, under his legs in the river, tripping him up. So this is all taking place around the ford crossing, which he eventually wins the battle. But um, And your depiction of that, by the way, uh, yeah, the painting of that <clears throat> is the backdrop to the, the opening of... Th- Chapter twelve, the last chapter of Island of the Setting Sun, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, it is that chapter, isn't it? It is that one, yeah. Um, which is the High Man chapter. Yeah. So uh, it, it gets more and more interesting. I'm amazed about that thirty. I think I didn't realise that. Yeah. But that was the that was the reason that that's what brought me on. It was the Christmas star, the Be- the Bethlehem star, was Mintaka. Again, this east-west thing, and as you say, Orion now holding the sun. There's a, there's an awful lot of symbolism going on there, now, mm. which is, I think, the more we look into this, uh, the more fascinated it becomes. You couldn't you couldn't make it up. Yeah, I, and I mean, just the, the the perhaps less prominent coincidental coincidental um, uh, uh, um, mythology. Uh, and place names. So, for instance, uh, Lou, who's one of the luminaries of the Tua de Danon, gives his name to County Louth, where yeah. much of the figure is located. That's right. Um, and he's been Cuchulain's father until recent times. The border between County Louth and County Meath was the Boyne River. That's right. And uh, the the name of Lou is derived. County Louth is Lou. Derived from that god, Lou Love, uh, Lou, Lou Samuel Donach, yeah. Lou the Many Gifted One. Mm-hmm. And so he's there. <clears throat> and as you say, Cucullin is there. He's standing in the river, fighting, obviously. But also Amergin, and just referring back to the symbolism of him stepping onto the shore of the river, as he basically, at that moment, with the sun in his hand, yeah. he's taking Ireland from the Tuatha Dé Danann and opening a new age in the history or the mythology, mythological history of the island. So it looks like we could possibly be entering a new age under this. But now, Richard, I'll be honest, and I want you to be honest. Yeah. There are lots of times over the years that I've reflected on that, and I've said to myself, "No, nah, it's just a load of nonsense. It's, mm. it's just a, a, just coincidences. We're just seeing patterns where there aren't any." And you just completely doubt it. And then there's other days where I think about all of the stuff we've just been talking about. And I think, wow, you know, that's 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 an extraordinary run of coincidences. And of course, there's a lot more detail in Island of the Setting Sun. Yes. Pertaining to the place names and the myths. I mean, there's, if you look at Orion, the way the Milky Way runs past his shoulder, there's lots of mythology and place names up there. I mean, I found one 
Balaboni, a townland northwest of RD, yeah. which would be embedded in the Milky Way, and that is derived from Balak Bofinna, the way of the white cow, which is the mm-hmm. Irish name for the Milky Way. And Bath of Marrow, the Smyrmar. Smyrmar. Smyrmar is the anglicisation, where uh, there was a magic bath of marrow, where was that animal marrow? The yeah. bones of animals yes. were were mashed up and placed into a bath, and that the wounded warrior Cairn, among others, yes. who was close to death, he was at death's door, he was about to drop, was placed into the bath and was wholly recovered. Yes, it was a healing again. And you were the one who pointed out to me many years ago that you remember seeing was it a cow bone in a fire? Oh yes, yes. Tell us about that. Yes, uh, there was a bit of a party out. Uh, Robert Tully uh, place Helen his sister was having a um, a kind of a solstice party and one of the, the guys um, his name is Kelly anyway uh, he he was interested in the archaeology and he decided to bring a big thigh bone of a cow and throw it into this fire that was burning because he was talking about how they changed the, you know, after fire. And he was talking about, what do you call it, when, when archaeologists find bones that are burnt. He oh, wanted oh, to see the effect. Cremated, cremated yeah, remains. Yeah, just yeah. to see the, the effect. And so this big cow bone was sitting in, in the fire for about an hour, and we were talking away about this, that, and the other. And the next thing, I heard this huge crack. And the next thing, the bones had split open, and all the marrow started to pour out, and it was, it was just astonishing because what pour, the marrow as it came out, it was sparkling, just like the Milky Way, mm. and it it made total sense to me at that moment why they would see it as a marrow, yeah, because it's exactly what it looks like. The the white marrow of Phelimid is one of the Irish names for the Milky Way. That detail is in the Mythical Ireland book. Um, and, I, and again, it would seem obscure, except for, as you say, when you see... You see it happening right in front of you. It's just, it's amazing. You know, what colour was the marrow? It's silvery. 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 It would see, because of the fire, it was spartan. You know, like, you know that kind of um, tinsel stuff? Yeah. Uh, you know that, what do you call that, sparkly stuff? Glitter? Glitter, yes. It's like that. Yeah. In the light. Glitter in liquid. Yeah. Yeah, or gel. Yeah, yeah like, it's like a gel ki- glitter. Yeah, like kiddies get these tubs of, you know, you know, you give play doh, but you also have these tubs of, um, what's it called? Uh, yeah. um, glitter. Gel. My my kids used to play with it. Um, uh, gl- gl- not gl- uh, what's it called? Um, I can't immediately think of it, but yeah. they used to play with this, and it was like a jello jellyish sort of um, not not like a, a a liquid as such that would run out of your hands. It was pliable, you yeah. know, but some of it was full of glitter. Well, that's exactly what it was like. Yeah, yeah. But you, but when you when you see it right in front of you, and it's night time, and you look up at the sky, the, the Milky Way. Yes, it's. I can see where they got the the association from. You just imagine them at a big campfire and cooking bones and throwing stuff in, and the bones splitting and all the marrow pouring out from the heat. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I, but you see, where Smarmor is, is where the Milky Way would run through the figure Yeah. of the, uh, the high man. It runs up past the left shoulder, Betelgeuse, yeah. and that famous upraised hand that the high man doesn't have, but but still has the Loud Village in the place where the sun would be above Orion. Mm. Interesting enough, Loud Village is where the head of the Christian church was for the first 60 years. And then it was moved to Armagh after that. But there's a big, what the remains of a cathedral that was left there. But it's, but before that it was a sun-worshipping uh, cult. Mm. So that, again, it all adds up to the, the place, the, the folklore and the position and the, yeah. and the astronomy. That's the point. Uh, and that's the, <laughs> that is the point at which you say, okay, this is, these coincidences are so laden with meaning. Mm. As to lead one to the belief or the supposition that, um, you know, it's more than just a coincidence. 
and yet there are still times when I think I'm just nuts, you know, and I'm just I've lost the plot and I'm seeing things that, you know. It's one of the great mysteries there. of the modern times. But do you think? Do you dwell on that sort of eschatological? Uh, end times aspect of it as I have written about that in Island of the Setting Sun about the idea that it might be connected with the ending of an age and the beginning of another I mean is that not just pure astrological thought I mean why why would that have any significance you know the sun is constantly the sun's solstice and equinox positions are constantly regressing through the through the zodiac Mm. Uh, maybe. Well, of course, in the last hundred years, the progress of um, science has gone through the roof, literally. We've never made such enormous advances science-wise mm. in the last hundred years. Yes, is... and almost every week is bringing new fascinating revelations. I see today, for instance, that Radio astronomers have found mysterious blobs in space in radio signals that they cannot explain. They don't know what they are. In the past week, China has successfully landed a craft on the moon, taken some rock samples, relaunched it back into space and brought those samples back to Earth. And that follows, very recently, the Japanese who sent a spacecraft to a comet. That's right. No, not a comet, sorry, an asteroid. Yeah. Landed a lander, a number of landers. Yeah. They had cameras on them. They took pictures from the surface of the asteroid. But one was able to retreat. What they did was they crashed one into the surface of the of the asteroid. And the, the orbiter flew by and scooped up some of the ejected material into a canister. Yeah. That canister landed in Western Australia recently. And... They've recovered it and found that it's got particles and dust and grains from this asteroid. I mean, it's mind blowing. It is. It's, but that's how fast progress has been made in the, just the last hundred years. Well, I would ask. In addition to what, how does it benefit us? And there's a lots of ways that the science benefits us. But I would ask, what is the price of that scientific advancement? To the deeper religious, spiritual, transcendent meaning of mythology and stories, etc. Has it rendered them obsolete? No. I well, not for so. us it hasn't. No. But... No, I don't... Um... Is this not all just a load of hocus-pocus, Richard, no? <laughs> I see. I just see. Just follow the evidence... And see what the answers are. There's no, just, there's no. I hate to say it, but I'm constantly playing devil's advocate. But <laughs> what is evidence? You know, you can't say that a story is evidence. You can't say that an arrangement of roads is evidence. No. You have to give me more than that. Well, I've only got so far, so I can't give you any more. Yeah, but I think you can. Isn't it true that you could certainly make a very strong, substantial case, substantial evidence case? Yeah, there's an awful lot of circumstantial evidence that seems to just defy logic in every other way. Things that are there that shouldn't be there, really. How did that... How can you ask? It's impossible. Uh, There were times, too, during our period of research, before Ireland was published. I mean, we've been friends ever since, but that was really the, 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 the very manically busy and extraordinary time when we were working together i know there were times when you expressed frustration with it and you didn't you told me on a few times not just the whole project but (laughs) specifically the high man you had sort of you didn't you did you it was like you had this uncertainty about it you didn't know whether was it driving you nuts at some stage Uh, it was yeah because i couldn't i couldn't explain it i couldn't i couldn't um how can you explain something that mysterious well, and abstract in a way. Yeah. I mean, I know it's an anthropomorphic figure, but there's a whole abstraction around a lot of it, isn't there? How much of it was deliberate? How much of it is coincidental? It's, it's, I've seen too much to think 
otherwise that is not that that is just a, a coincidence there's too much um pointing in in one direction if you like that it's deliberate and it's not a it's not a coincidence it's quite deliberate the whole setup they knew what they were doing um we're just getting the bits and pieces we're not we haven't got the full picture yet <clears throat> We don't. I don't know the answer. I'm not. Um, I'm not um, clever enough, or smart enough. Or I don't have the ability to to explain logically how this is. Because we've uh, arrived at a lot of it intuitively, not logically. Yeah. So it requires a more intuitive explanation, perhaps. Yeah, I would like a lot of more science science people to look at it, uh, just to examine it as a as another project for them to work on, and see if there's other stuff there that we don't know. They might end up completely ridiculing it. I don't, it doesn't bother me. Yeah. Uh, if you don't point out something for people to examine, uh, you could be missing something that is something. There is, if there is something there, it's as well to have it out in the open rather than not. Yes. Because we don't know where it could lead to. Mm. We don't know. Is there a particular branch of science that you think would be best placed to examine it? Like, would um, you like a statistician to look at it? Uh, that could be another one, yes. A physicist? Um, yeah. Um, I'm sure there's somebody out there that will know exactly what what this is yeah. and would have a better explanation than maybe you or I have. The best way we can really describe it is an emergent incipient uh, uh, hypothesis that this figure is there um, pareidolia is the human tendency to find patterns where there are none um, but having seen it you can't unsee it that's the thing mm. um, and when you follow the threads uh, around it you find that the threads lead you into all sorts of magnificent realms Quite a lot of it, as you say, is intuitive and speculative um, and abstract. But when you go to bed at night, you can't help thinking that there's a much deeper meaning to it, a, a, a real substance to it, mm. I think is the fairest way I could explain it personally. Yeah, yeah it's, just, it's just one of those things. I don't have any more words for it. I don't. Um, I don't have any more explanation. I can just show you things and point yeah. things out, but that's all I can do. Given that you have looked at certain passages in the Bible uh, from a, the point of view of astronomy and constellations and stars, are you inclined to consider it a sort of a uh, a biblical uh, thing. Uh, yes, I'm afraid so. Yeah. And in what context? In in that changing of ages context, mm. something big. It's coming, yes, something's coming. If it hasn't already arrived. <clears throat> well, in the symbolism of Amergin carrying the sun and the Olympic torch bearer and the Statue of Liberty. And the summer solstice sun, the highest height of the sun in the northern hemisphere, being carried across the sky by the giant man slash god slash warrior slash hunter. Yeah. I am inclined to see in that from from certainly from a an optimistic, a sanguine viewpoint, I'm inclined to see in that you given what you've just been say, saying about all the the astonishing yeah. discoveries and revelations of science in the past century i'm inclined to see that as man mankind man men and women of yeah. course 
at the height of their intellect, the height of their achievement, the height of their power, the carrying of the light, uh, perhaps also representing other things like 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 justice and equality and all yes. of that. However, inevitably, one in considering that is also drawn to the inevitable decline of that light and the waning of Orion as he sinks, begins to his slow sink over the next 13,000 years, having reached this apex and what that might symbolise. Well, to me, it's a symbol of hope um, because you're bringing the light to the world again, I think. There's some, there's some, it's, it seems to be a good thing, mm. not a bad thing. Yeah. That, um, it's like all men will be, all mankind will be revealed, everything will be revealed now with this light, whatever that is. It's like um, the darkness will fall away. All the bad stuff is going to go. It's now coming to a good time. When things will be done right. What would you call it? Evil hates light. And this is a light. The light scatters the darkness. And gets rid of us. It's almost in the Egyptian thing. You see uh, this Orion figure. With a spear. And he's, he's killing the animal below him. Which is um, the darkness. The night. So it is spearing, the light is spearing the animal, the, de- the death of, it's like the death of darkness. So it's the killing of that. That's the symbolism I see. So that's probably ended on a, a better, a, a lighter note. <laughs> <laughs> he says rather punningly. Yeah. Well, um, it's nice. Yes, I think it's lovely. Uh, that if you talk about carrying light that you should seem, be seen to be expressing some optimism because there's quite a lot of uh, pessimism around at the moment and no. it would seem that we're going in the wrong direction you know there is a lot of anger and conflict and well, I, I, I think psychosis, I think, actually, I think what's happening in the is, Western world at the moment. I think what's happening at the moment in the world is we're beginning to see the dark is separating from the light. You begin to see the good from the bad. The, the, bad, the bad and the evil ones, or people, if you like, are becoming more obvious now. Yeah. Be, you know, it's obvious that certain governments are, are corrupt beyond this measure yeah that they have no um no empathy for people they've no all they can think of is money and greed you know greed and stuff but this thing this light now is going to separate that so you, be, you, you what you're beginning to see is that those on it's like separating the wheat from the shaft at the moment that's what it's like you begin to see the the intentions of bad people and the intentions of good people more clearly from now on, there's a divide taking place. Is that necessarily a good thing? Because, I mean, uh, C.G. Young, who I often talk about, uh, was adamant that the darkness and the light are are present in each of us. Yes. In, 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 in equal measure. We suppress one uh, and the other comes out in grotesque forms. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the light and shadow is part of what we are. We have the light and we have the shadow. If you separate them, are you not in danger of causing some sort of dissociation or some sort of mass schizophrenia? Yeah, well, I saw I saw a nice little post uh, one, one time and it was about a child asking the old man, you know, a bit, this, you heard the story about the good wolf and the bad wolf. <laughs> I know this one, yeah. You know, and you yeah. probably all know it. I know, but tell it's them the one, they It's might. the one where, and the child said, but who wins? And he said, well, it's the one you feed the most. <laughs> yeah. It's as simple as that. So yeah. if you feed the good, you'll get, that'll win. And if you feed the bad. And what happens when you separate them? Well, it's, I think a lot of people don't know what's right and wrong nowadays. Oh, you're damn right about that. 
So I think what's happening now is the right people are beginning to. It's becoming more obvious as, as to who's right and wrong. Because by their actions, you you know what what they're like. By their the more obvious. That's biblical, isn't it? it by is, yeah. by their deeds, you shall know them. Is it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Not not their words, their deeds. Yeah. Yeah, it's what they do, not what they say. It's what the it's the actions that speak loudest. So if you if you're listening to a politician saying I'll do this and I'm going to do that, <laughs> and he does the complete opposite when he gets into power, yeah, but yeah. then it's the actions that reveal the. Is that not every truth. politician? <laughs> not everyone, no, no, not them no. all. No, there are there are people out there trying. I want to believe there are some out there trying. Mm. Yes, we desperately need some honesty and integrity, and yeah, uh, and so we conclude this conversation uh, with uh, the fascinating uh, revelation of the high man and its uh, correlation with uh, not just mythology and place names and monuments in the Irish landscape but its apparent uh, correlation with uh, world events and uh, possible changes to come uh, which which underlines, I suppose, the cosmological element of the exploration, uh, which has taken it to much deeper realms um, and taken it beyond a work that deals purely in, uh, you know, in s- sort of uh, scientific and empirical uh, terms, uh, looking at sizes and distances and measurements uh, and and uh, I suppose gives the whole thing a sort of a deeper meaning which is personal and at once universal as well I think yeah it's just if you can get a bit of structure back into a society that's that's good for all not not just for a few we'd be doing okay mm. a lovely magnanimous thought to finish this wonderful conversation and uh, we'll come back for more because there's lots more thanks for listening i'm anthony murphy of mythical ireland and i've been talking to my good friend and co-author richard moore <laughs>